Okay, so welcome. It's about two minutes past the start uh, and I can see lots of people are here, so we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to the first part of our symposium on artificial intelligence in qualitative analysis, uh, which is brought to you via a partnership uh, between the CACDAS Networking Project and the Social Research Association. So just to tell you a little bit about ourselves, the CACDAS Networking Project is based in the sociology department at the University of Surrey in the UK. Uh, and we aim to raise awareness about and build capacity in the use of digital tools designed for the analysis of qualitative data. And we do that in a number of different ways, including running training events, webinars, podcasts, sharing open access resources, and providing platforms like this symposium to debate the role and use of technology in qualitative analysis. The Social Research Association is a registered charity, also based in the UK, whose aim it is to promote excellence in social research across the professions. So that might be research undertaken in universities, in government departments, research agencies, or by individual consultancies and professionals. You can find out more about both organisations from our websites and LinkedIn pages, and we'll post those links uh, in the chat for you. OK, so I'm Christina Silva. I'm the director of the CACDAS Networking Project. Uh, and as I said, I'm delighted to welcome you all here today. Uh, I'm, and I'm here along with my colleague, uh, Dr. Sarah Bullock, uh, who's a teaching fellow at the university, and she works with me at the CACDAS Networking Project, and also Graham Ferrant, who's the chief executive of the Social Research Association. And although the three of us are fronting uh, this two-part event, the second part of which is coming up this time next week on the December the 1st, uh, there are many others who have been working away very hard in the background, and to them we're particularly grateful uh, because we wouldn't have got to this point without them. I'd also like at the right at the outset to extend our immense thanks to all of our speakers. Uh, we're able to bring this event to you for free only because of their willingness to give up their time for free. One of the things that's characterized the field of computer-assisted qualitative analysis since the beginning, actually, is the openness amongst those who are involved and some of them are in commercial competition with one another so it's worth just uh, acknowledging uh, that they come together for the good of research practice and to contribute constructively to events like this is something that uh, makes uh, what we all do uh, so much easier. Okay so what's this symposium all about uh, and how did it come about? Well basically what we thought uh, was that it would be a really valuable um, uh, opportunity to create a space to bring together all of those involved in developing and using AI tools uh, to discuss them. Over the past 12 months or so, there's been a resurgence and a broadening of interest in the role and use of computer assistance for qualitative analysis. And that's in part resulted from the widespread availability of generative AI tools such as ChatGPT, uh, and the underlying large language models. That interest is evident across many different contexts, including government, social research, academics doing qualitative studies and teaching qualitative methods, as well as market researchers, publishers, students, uh, and many others. But the responses to these developments are mixed. You could even say polarized. Some welcome these advances, others are skeptical, concerned, or even dismissive. So one of the original purposes for founding the CACDAS networking project, which happened back in 1994, was to provide platforms to debate the role of computers in qualitative analysis. And at that time, there were many concerns that computers would take over. Indeed, that was one of the major themes for the first international gathering of developers, methodologists and researchers, which happened in 1989. And that led actually to the development of the CACDAS project in the first place. So although those fears came to be understood as largely unfounded, it's also true to say that they're rising again in some quarters uh, due to the recent developments. Uh, in fact, there have been several eras of development technologically and methodologically in qualitative research, uh, and the rise of generative AI is just the latest. So we're here today and next week to discuss these developments uh, opportunities, practices, challenges, and also the ethics of AI in qualitative research. 
The two parts are split like this. Today, we are focusing on developments in the tools themselves uh, and the methodological implications of their use. And then next week, there'll be some presentations by researchers who've been using some of these tools and a panel discussion by experts working in government, industry and academia about the opportunities, challenges and ethics. But what even is AI in the context of qualitative analysis? For the purposes of this symposium, we're casting the net wide in terms of tools and terminological understandings. You'll see as the symposium progresses that not only are there a range of tools and a range of perceptions about them, there are also different definitions about what AI is, what the term encompasses, whether it's a useful label, whether it's misleading or even misused. And of course, we are going to be discussing the most recent developments, the different ways in which generative AI is being harnessed or not. But we're also going to be discussing other sophisticated and powerful uses of computers to assist qualitative analysis. So not only generative AI, but also machine learning tools, topic modeling, text mining, sentiment analysis, and so on. These tools are actually not so new. Um, and they've been around for a number of years and we're including them because they're often understood to fall under the umbrella of uh, AI and they're being used very powerfully and very extensively by qualitative ana analysts in many different contexts. So we're gonna be talking about definitions, tools, methods and uses. Regardless of the terminology though, what you'll notice is a number of common strands that run through both parts of this symposium, not least the discussion about the nature of the relationship between human interpretation and computer assistance. This issue has been central to the field ever since the first of this genre of software became available in the mid 1980s. And with good reason, I think, given the diversity in how qualitative materials are used and analyzed. One thing that qualitative research is not is homogenous, neither in method nor in the use of tools. And we really wanted to reflect that uh, in this symposium. And we really hope that the presentations, speakers and topics under discussion that we've brought together this afternoon and also next week will spark many avenues for continued discussion, collaboration and methodological and technical creativity. Methods and tools, we believe, can enable flexible, creative and high quality research and debating the issues involved in their use is part of how they are continually developed. Uh, we hope that this symposium will be part of that process and that the conversation continues beyond uh, these two sessions today and next week. So on to our schedule for today then. What we have in store for you today are two things. First, we have presentations from the developers of five qualitative analysis tools, each speaking to the same topic, the what, why and how of AI in their products. We're aware that the five tools here today are not the only ones. Many of you may be using different tools, but there's only a certain amount of time that we've got available. And the five that we've brought together here will illustrate the variety that I've just alluded to. The presentations have been pre-recorded and we'll begin by watching the first three, which are coming from CoLoop, DiscoverText and Leximansa. And that will be followed by a live Q&A session uh, with those speakers. And then after a short break, uh, which will be about 3.20 UK time, so just over an hour from now, we'll hear from the final two presentations, which will be from Max QDA and Wordstat, and that will be followed by a live Q&A session with them. And then the second part of today is going to be a live conversation about the methodological implications of those technological developments. So my colleague, Dr. Sarah Bullock, who, as I mentioned earlier, works with me at the Cactus Networking Project, is going to be in conversation with two very experienced qualitative methodologists who've been engaged uh, with the field of qualitative software since the late 1980s, Dr. Susanna Frieser and Dr. Silvana de Gregorio. Many of you here today I know will be very familiar with them and their work already, but Sarah will introduce them properly to you later on uh, when we get to that part of the day. 
Okay, for now, let's get going uh, with uh, with the actual session today, which will be our first developer presentation. As I mentioned earlier, these are pre-recorded and we're playing the presentations in alphabetical order, order as per product name. So that means that we're starting with Coloop uh, and a talk by Jack Bowen. Jack has been building research tools using generative AI since graduating from the University of Oxford with a master's in material sciences in 2020. He co-founded Genie.io, which is an AI summarization tool aimed at students and academics. And in March this year, uh, also launched Coloop, a qualitative analysis tool, which Jack is here to talk about today. They were prompted to develop Coloop as a result of their own experience conducting market and product research. And the tool is rapidly developing both in terms of functionality and user base. So shortly I'll hand it over uh, and let Jack tell you about the details of what Coloop is and how it works uh, in his pre-recorded presentation. Hi there, my name's Jack. I'm one of the builders of Coloop and I'm here to tell you about our thesis around the what, why and how of qualitative AI how this has influenced our product and why you as researchers should be really excited about what's coming next. Let's jump in. So firstly, as researchers, what are the problems that we face? Well, for a start, we're slow. It takes us a long time to read through, synthesize, digest, and find quotes within our research material. When conducting qualitative research, we often have to deal with a huge number of different file types, formats, and third-party tools. This means that we can get easily overloaded by a huge number of audio, video, transcripts, spreadsheets, and more. When this happens, we can become fatigued. After many hours of mining away our data, our performance can begin to degrade. When this happens, we become more susceptible to cognitive biases. These include things such as anchoring, egocentric, and confirmation bias, which means that our results can vary dramatically depending on who we are how we're feeling, or even the last thing that we read. By contrast, AI models aren't perfect either. They struggle with factual accuracy, contextual awareness, they lack transparency, and they're significantly worse than humans at logical reasoning. This means that they are prone to make things up, misunderstand the layers of situational nuance, context around a project, fail to explain how they've reached a particular conclusion, or fail to properly interpret causal chains and relationships required to untangle complicated problems. So who makes the better researcher? Is it humans or is it AI? Well, we kind of think the answer is neither. In fact, when you look closely, they seem more to complement rather than to conflict. AI models are fast, less susceptible to cognitive biases, aren't overloaded and never become fatigued. Humans have excellent context awareness, are meticulous at noticing inaccuracies, can reason clearly about complex problems and can come up with creative ways to solve them. So how can we make the most of our respective strengths and weaknesses? Well, we think the perfect AI tool should, to quote Steve Jobs, function as a bicycle for the mind. Firstly, it should give us time. It should get us from A to B with less manual effort. By liberating us from manual time-consuming tasks like searching and summarizing, we can expend our valuable cognitive resources on reasoning, interpretation, and strategy. Secondly, it should give us ownership. It should amplify and support us along the journey, but just like a bicycle, we should still be the ones turning the pedals and the handlebars rather than being driven and blindly trusting in where we end up. Finally, it should give us ease of use. It should work seamlessly with our existing infrastructure. In the context of an AI tool, this means it should be fast to adopt and drop simply into our processes and daily lives by just working with all of the tools and data that we already use. So how are we approaching this with Coloop? Well, first we start with the context. Users upload discussion guides, provide briefs, objectives, and a description of their project. This helps the AI to personalize its outputs towards exactly what it is you want to know from your research project. Once the project is set up, you can now import your data. At this stage, we use a range of AI models and rule-based algorithms to transcribe, translate, classify, and index your data into a single, unified, and searchable structure. 
We support a range of different formats, languages, and even a growing number of popular third-party tools with more due to be released in the coming weeks. Although this data is now organized, this is still an overwhelming amount of information to process. Next, we need to come up with a sensible way of sorting it into key themes. Using your objectives and any background information, Coloop will suggest key questions or simply allow you to enter your own into an automated analysis grid. Here, we use AI models to query and consolidate facts and evidence from your transcripts into suggested themes. These themes are ranked by frequency and hyperlinked directly to the verbatim. This enables a simple researcher-centric feedback loop for you to explore, evaluate, and iterate your thinking. Once you've uncovered some interesting themes, you can then develop them further using the AI chat. The chat is filtered and can be scoped to focus on specific files, activities, tasks, or questions. It functions like a perfect objective memory of your data, enabling you to find quotes, hypothesis test ideas, and confirm your intuitions. As with the analysis grid, all generations are linked directly back to the verbatim. Illustrative quotes can even be downloaded directly as video snippets and sent to your edit team for the production of reels and other rich media. Putting this all together gives researchers a simple hypothesis-led approach that offloads manual work to the machine and leaves you free to explore ideas and iterate your pitch in a close collaborative loop with an AI that makes the most of what it's good at and the most of what you're good at. Finally, we come to the why. Why is now an exciting time for Qual? AI tools like ours and the other fantastic innovative tools at this symposium are creating new opportunities for research products and offerings that weren't possible before. New capabilities include things such as larger qual and quant studies that can draw both mechanistic and representative understanding for further development. Faster turnaround projects to help improve clients' chances of making the best expected decisions in time-pressured situations where traditional research is simply too slow. Augmented analysis and report writing that enables researchers to spend more time polishing, improving, and communicating their insights. Cheaper, partially automated projects for clients who've previously lacked the budget to commission high quality research are now also possible. And finally, the ability to efficiently analyze traditionally more complex formats, such as mood boards, videos, and audio, without the need for manual tagging, transcribing, and translating. So how can you seize the opportunity? Well, we've had the pleasure of supporting over 80 consultancies and time and time again, have seen eager first movers traveling ahead on the adoption curve, developing new offerings and seeing the benefits. Trailblazers in this space do three things. One, they experiment. They try things out, discover their own offerings and differentiate themselves. Two, they learn. They understand and get comfortable with the real risks and benefits of AI. And three, they implement. They put new methods and practices to work on live projects and educate their clients about the new value they can bring. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you're all now as excited as we are about the AI powered future of Qual. Get ahead of the curve and join 500 other insights professionals and AI specialists at ChatGPT for Insights on LinkedIn. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Jack, uh, for that presentation. Uh, our next uh, developer presentation uh, is from Dr. Stuart Shulman who is the founder and CEO of TechSifter, which develops Discover Text. And he's just opened up his video, I can see. Hi. Um, and Discover Text is the tool that he's here to speak about today. But Stu has a long history and extensive experience in methods and software development. Um, and he will share just <laughs> some of that with us today uh, when he recounts his story uh, in his pre-recorded presentation about the what, how, and why of AI in Discover Text. Stu is formerly a University of Massachusetts Amherst political science professor 
and the Vice President of Text Analytics at Vision Critical. He was also the founder and director of Qualitative Data Analysis Program, QDAP, uh, at the University of Pittsburgh and at UMass Amherst. And as well as inventing Discover Text, together with Mark Hoy, Stu was the um, sole inventor of its predecessor, the Coding Analysis Toolkit. And that was an open source text analysis software project that recorded approaching two and a half million human text classification observations. He also invented Sifter, a tool designed primarily for academic researchers who gained self-serve access to the complete undeleted history of Twitter, when it was called Twitter, and published studies across disciplines. My name is Stu. Thanks for having me. My talk is titled Artificial Intelligence is Not What We Do. We're not an AI company. We are an HI company, and we think humans are more important than machines. We like machines, we just don't worship machines. We keep humans in the loop when we're doing search, filtering, deciding how to deal with duplicates and near duplicates, organizing human annotators. These are all techniques where information retrieval, not AI, are core attributes of the process. Code and retrieve is a fundamental qualitative technique. So information retrieval techniques should sound familiar, but they should not be mistaken for AI. Even the fifth machine learning or natural language processing, which depends on human annotation, must be considered a language technology derived from human intelligence, not machine. Personally, I don't think any of this is AI. I've used some of these techniques in my own research. They are mostly information retrieval techniques or unsupervised machine learning. There's a lot of stuff on TV that I want to make sure is not happening in the AI world without humans to oversee the fact that judgment is required to use all insights from tools. And that's where I really want to lay down the gauntlet. Discover text, the theory, the tools, the methods, they are all human-centric. So tools, whether they're for woodworking or landscaping or academic research, they are powerful. They give humans leverage. There's a difference between a beginner, intermediate, and advanced tool users. Some tools can be quite dangerous if they're used by beginners in ways that don't reflect knowledge and experience about safety, caution, other things that might happen and along the way. So I see a lot of analogies between the tools that I use in my garden or my workbench to build things and the tools that I use to do research. So I'm going to tell you a story. It's the story some of you may have heard before of how I became a coder. I had an English professor who taught me to write based on deep reading. And deep reading meant if I was writing a thesis about these two books, I would read and reread the books until things emerged from the text. I had no training in qualitative research. This was all literary theory. I had a political science professor, Howard Zinn, who also taught me to look closely at historical texts. So between my English professor and my political science professor, in the late 80s, I was doing inductive qualitative research. I just didn't know it. And believe it or not, I wrote a PhD thesis 10 years later that also used a kind of organic qualitative research method, truly inductive, where I was looking for information about the history of agriculture and lending to farmers. And I ended up finding a whole constellation of issues inductively in the these old crumbling newspapers and one in particular really caught my attention. Like a lot of things in qualitative research, it was something that I was not looking for. And I went on to write one of my first peer review publications about the business of soil fertility and was able to uncover something that very few people had ever noticed or written about. Indeed, came up with a categorization of different types of journalism from the progressive era that revolved around collecting and reading very closely thousands of newspapers, not just the articles about farm credit, but all the articles around those articles to see what was going on, which led me to want to tell you a little bit about the chance factor. And the chance factor is that sometimes things happen in your life by chance that change your life and focus your research and give you a clue, again, almost inductively of where to go. So I'd been a 
garlic farmer. I had a few years off from grad school. Went back to be a political science grad student. Got a bunch of money from a variety of funders to hold a conference on the politics of sustainable agriculture. And so having been a farmer and having studied sustainable agriculture and had meetings about it, I was very lucky when by chance I noticed a proposed regulation to define the standard for the word organic across all U.S. agriculture. I started getting funding from the National Science Foundation. I started using software called Nudist, which became in vivo. I got this zip disk with tens of thousands of public comments on it. More money came in. We started working with groups of government agencies and students and computer science professors to develop a framework of what was needed to do certain kinds of work at the government level. And out of that period in my life, I developed this spectrum of methods approaches. The earliest slide I've been able to find is 2009, but we'd been talking about it for a couple of years. My training was as a positivist political scientist. Quantitative statistics, econometrics, applied econometrics, that was considered the methods. Also, game theory was on the rise. At the other end of the spectrum, the purest end, is where I was naturally doing all my work. That undergraduate thesis, my PhD thesis, they all embraced purest qualitative of tradition, which involves a lot of reading, a lot of reading, no automation. Out of all this, because of some of the influences of the computer scientists I was collaborating with and the statisticians and people from a wide variety of disciplines and languages around the world, we embraced the idea that there is no right method. And this was controversial at the time. I think it's more widely accepted now. For the time to be a pluralist or somebody who embraced open-minded methods and was flexible about when to use certain techniques and when to use others and move freely back and forth, this guided my work, as did this amazing book, one of the most important books along the way, Fielding and Lee's book on computer analysis and qualitative research. And I highlight here the parts that really changed my whole orientation to research and to software, this idea of finding enough or all the potentially relevant material, the saturation, the point where looking at more material teaches you nothing. This was really a major breakthrough for me conceptually, as were these books by Jarvis and Weinberger about building platforms and filtering as opposed to a standard of categorization and flexibility. And the Glick book is my favorite. I've read it six times. I have the audio book. I can always go back to it and see where my work fits at the end of his story. Along the way, we were very grateful to work with the developers of Atlas. They sponsored my research lab, gave us licenses. We did talk about them building tools to do some of the things my computer scientists wanted because we were using Atlas to label data for computer scientists. At the time, Thomas declined, and so we went on to build some of our own tools. I was working under the University of Pittsburgh. I ran an interdisciplinary labeling lab. In 2008, I published what was probably the best description of the work we were doing at the time with one of my grad students, Lucy Liu, and it described both the state of play in qualitative computer-based research and introduce people to our platform, which was developed originally as a way to do some of the measurements we needed when two or more people used Atlas TI to do labeling. That's why you see Atlas TI at upload preparation. We were still supporting Atlas users and doing work with Atlas ourselves. But once we started building software, we did get a little bit carried away with the whole project. The coding analysis toolkit ended up being 25,000 lines of code. I think Discover Text is closer to 800,000 lines of code. And the thing that captured my attention was that the problem fundamental to text classification was that it's really hard to put things into categories, to know what the right categories are, what to get people to agree on them. A fundamental shaping article for me, the ideas were very familiar because we've been dealing with this problem text as data for quite some time when this article came out and it nicely summarized the proper role for validation in this work. And I think this is where if qualitative is going to embrace AI, you have to also embrace the idea of validation, which requires in the end reading, not the substitution of pretty pictures for the work of somebody who reads. And we do live in a time where you can distribute the work of reading things across a large group of people and do things with those observations. Where we came in with software was we needed a tool that could help us explain if you give different humans the same task, will they do it consistently? Are they reliable? Will they make 
valid observations? Are they slow or fast? Are the machines learning from them producing valid or usable output? All of these things require measurement and also they require enough data and enough activity to and enough diversity in that activity to really understand the landscape of interpretation and as a result of doing this work over so many projects in so many ways i've come to embrace a philosophy whereby you break things down into very specific tasks often binaries for example is this tweet a first person expression of fear or not we do a lot of binary coding it builds better machine learning models. We also measure interrater reliability. We've been doing so since 2005 in our lab. And there's a lot that can be said about this. A whole talk could be given on just what the landscape of human interpretation means. But the main takeaway for me is if you have more coders and more codes, you're going to have more disagreement. If you give more choices to coders, you're going to have more disagreement. If you want your coders to agree to produce good machine learning, you have to simplify the model. Sometimes disagreement is good because the discussion of those disagreements can be very informative. So for example, when we built our adjudication mechanism to look at how, say in this case, five people labeled this post from a Chinese microblog and the task was, is this post about MH17, a 777 that was shot down where all the passengers died? Four coders said it was, one coder said it wasn't. Adjudication allows us not only to produce gold standard training sets for machine learning, but also to learn something about the coders as they do this. So we're constantly iterating human and machine learning, fast iterations, clearly defined tasks, building machine learning models. So the contribution we make is not to AI, but it's to building a platform that academics can use for free to use innovative tools for measurement, replication, innovative theories about coding and annotation, to do projects that are scalable, whether they're inductive or deductive, to display Twitter data in a legal way and to study this very dangerous platform, certain tools for sampling, for searching, for filtering. All of these tools have unique properties that were in some way accidental developments, but when they're used together or independently, they produce unique research results. So Discover Text is not an AI tool, but it is a free platform. I do free trainings. I pay for the storage, the electricity, the maintenance. It works. People get published. I even got published helping somebody else. I hope we can talk about it. Book a meeting. Thanks very much. So thank you very much uh, for that to Stu. I can see quite a few questions coming through, so that's great. But we're going to move on to our final in the first set of these uh, developer presentations now uh, with a uh, presentation from Dr. Andrew Smith uh, about Leximancer. So let me introduce you to Andrew, who is here with us today. Andrew invented Leximancer, uh, and he's going to speak about that today in terms of, like all of the other presentations, the what, how and why of AI. Uh, within the tool. Andrew began his career in physics and cognitive science, and he gained his PhD from the University of Queensland in Australia in the early 1990s in physics. He then worked in IT, where he became particularly interested in the need for designing useful technology for consumers. And it's these experiences, together with his master's degree in information science, that led him to the conclusion that robust computational systems for quantifying and visualizing conceptual information in large collections of textual material is what was needed. And thus, Leximancer was born. Hi, I'm Andrew Smith, and I'll be taking you through the design of Leximancer. So first, the, um, the reasoning behind the design I uh, always felt that um, the representative nature of the language model was the most important thing. I mean, we're, we're building software which is designed to model and hence understand uh, data um, from a variety of sources, some of which we're familiar with and some of which we're not. Um, so um, that leaves us the idea of the faithfulness or fidelity of the language model. Uh, and what I'm talking about here is if we're trying to understand and reinstate meaning from a, a piece of text, um, the, the model we use to do that has to be 
faithful to the model that was used to, to generate it. They have to match. For a statistician, I guess this, this is a very familiar idea of um, you know, building a model from a representative sample of the population, uh, a sufficient representative sample, will give you meaningful results from the model. But if you don't do that, you know, if you if you take uh, a random data set, a data set from overseas, a different culture, a different time, um, or from different social setting, for example, even your focus group versus a person on their own, um, they will adopt a different language model. So you know, if you if you take a non-representative set of data and build a language model from that, you will get uh, biased results, and you may not know how biased they are. A much uh, more unavoidable consideration uh, than just looking at vocabulary and, and grammar or syntax is the actual semantics. You know, and, and a language model, uh, these days people are using language models that are supposed to also contain semantics. For example, you know, chat GPT, you're asking it questions and you're kind of expecting a factual answer. You know, even though that's not that reliable, it is still um, performing a semantic analysis of, of a sort and certainly producing semantics in its responses. And, and I can't see you know, uh, any way that this can work unless the model actually contains the semantics of the situation you're looking at. So I guess in the end, it's about being a good listener. Um, and, you know, when you're listening to someone, when you're in a new situation, new person, going to a cocktail party with a new group of people, um, well, I find it's best to listen for a while, um, integrate up a language model and also a semantic model of how things are said, how emotions are indicated, what they mean, what's good, what's bad, um, and you know what the situation is they're talking about before you jump on in and start trying to uh, respond or, or formulate a response or a policy. Um, and I, that's that's the design of Lexmancer really. You know, you you collect um, a sufficient amount of text from the appropriate sources at the appropriate time, and you let the software build a a language model, which is transparent, um, it's designed for aiding human understanding. Um, and then you inspect this model uh, from the schema, the conceptual schema at the top, right down to the underlying stories. Um, so you can do the sense making. An auxiliary question here is, uh, does the research show uh, what the structure of the language schema uh, that's contained in real text. You know, do we know what it looks like? And the answer is yes. It um, can be called a scale-free or a small world network, which is a, a type of a complex network. Um, this is this paper was foundational, uh, came out in 2001, and um, just showing that if you take uh, keywords look at their proximity within text segments such as phrases or sentences, um, and those become links in a network, you get uh, one of these small world or scale-free networks. So all those ideas, a little bit of philosophy, um, the, you know, the experimental observations of language as it's performed in the world, um, so they led to the design elements that went into Lexamansa. Um, so the tool tries to help you be a good listener. It's designed to extract a language model from a sufficient, potentially large amount of text um, in the most natural form, a, a small world concept network. And they're meant to aid human understanding. So the, um, the kit that, you, that comes with Lexamansa, um, I kind of describe it as AI supported uh, language schema modeling. So you start off by selecting um, a collection of text, relevant text, um, and then the software goes through and extracts the text from each of the documents. It splits the sentences uh, into words. It splits the paragraph into sentences. 
um, and it will uh, assign metadata, um, which you can think of as categorical variables associated with each utterance, like who said it, uh, their gender, their age bracket, um, you know, what newspaper the, uh, the piece of text came from. Um, so those categorical variables as well um, are extracted. Uh, then the software goes on to to start uh, building a code book, a, a a dictionary of concepts which are typical of the data, um, trying to give you a consensus model. So this starts off by um, extracting the uh, the important keywords from the text, and so Lexamans has a and an algorithm which which ranks keywords um, by how central they are to the discourse, um, and you can in fact choose how how deep you want to go down that ranking. Um, you can have a lot of concepts to have a rich map, or just the most important at the top end of that uh, scale-free distribution of concepts. You can optionally uh, specify other key terms of particular interest. Uh, so if you want to give a keyword like culture or um, um, gender or, or health and safety, um, you can specify those as, as key terms uh, for uh, your own conceptual uh, dictionary. And the, the uh, machine learning like Samantha will, will pick up those equally to build them into, into fully fledged concepts. So, um, so then once Lexmenza has these, uh, these vocabulary lists for each concept, these are used to measure the presence or absence of a concept in a piece of text. Uh, and so we call that coding or classification is another word for it, um, where you take each text segment and the software uh, tags it with the concepts that are indicated by the words used. And then that in turn, leads to um, doing uh, the bookkeeping, counting co-occurrence of concepts, um, pairs of concepts actually, uh, to build a network. And a network is nothing more than, you know, a collection of nodes and links between pairs of nodes. So, um, so yeah, and that's, that's where Lexamensa goes about extracting that small world concept network from the text. Um, then uh, once that's done, um, Lexamancy uses that to create a concept map and other reports and you also have access to a uh, search engine which, are, which lets you do concept search and keyword search through the text which is essential for making sense of it. How are some of these uh, uh, things done um, in Lexamancy? Let's call them algorithms. Um, so latent concept discovery it's a, uh, it's a type of machine learning, which is often called bootstrapping. Um, it starts off by expecting, you know, at the front end to know what are the keywords in the text. And so Lexamans has, a, has a, an algorithm which ranks keywords, but you can um, define your own. And then for each of those, it, it will um, go through and find the words that, are, that appear often with that word in text segments. And the text segment size is two sentences in Lexamensa by default, but you can change that. Uh, so within a two sentence window. And you know, the words that co-occur frequently with a target word like rifle and don't, don't occur much elsewhere, they'll get a strong attachment and uh, will join the family, if you like, be added into the definition of rifle and we'll get a higher score here, a higher relevancy or prediction score. Um, and it does this iteratively to, to grow the footprint of that concept throughout the text. Why do we do this? To give you completeness of coding, because people don't always just use the keyword, they use other words to indicate an idea, but we want the coding to know that and to be able to find and, and tag or code those concepts wherever they appear. This is just an example of coding. You see um, codes attached to text segments uh, and you can, and the system counts how many times pairs of concepts co-occur and puts them in a big data structure called 
Well, you call a concept co-occurrence uh, matrix. Um, or if you were doing multi-dimensional scaling, you call it an affinity matrix. Um, so this tells you how many times each of these concepts codes with every other concept. Um, and uh, that is in turn a network because it is telling you the strength of connection between each pair of, of nodes in the network. And that's the underlying data structure. Once the software has generated that, you can export that and do your own thing with it, but it generates several reports from that. Uh, and one of those, the main one, is the concept map. And so you can see it's a network of concepts. Concepts, are, some concepts are very important. They're very central. They have a big dot and many are small peripheral concepts. There are pathways that track the, the typical narratives between them. And uh, because it's a hierarchical network, we can do a hierarchical cluster and that generates these theme bubbles, these, these colored circles. Um, you can actually change the level of that. Um, because it's a hierarchical analysis, you can get a lot of um, very tight clusters or a few very broad clusters. Uh, to do for your thematic analysis. On the right hand side you can explore the concept co-occurrence matrix so it's like relational content content analysis or, or a more quantitative view. You can also drill down to the text and you can in, inspect the the latent concepts in the thesaurus. So uh, it's you know full disclosure you can you can see all the moving parts and the underlying text. Uh, Lexamance has been used for various things, you know, literature review, uh, developing definitions from literature, um, doing customer analysis, um, and, you know, analyzing media, social media, but also newspaper and, uh, and speeches and, uh, you know, submissions to inquiries as a rich data source where you have public submissions to a government inquiry. Um, I just, I went and, um, to Google Scholar and, and just pulled out a few articles. Um, in total there are 7,000 or so uh, citations on Google Scholar for Lexamancer, but just looking at some of the ones since 2022, um, I, I was surprised at, at the, the number of different uh, ways the tool is being used in um, marketing, business, tourism, health, education. Um, have a bit of a look through those lists to see the the, uh, the the different disciplines. But of course, you know, if you're curious, you can just go to Google Scholar and just search for Lake Samantha and, and whatever it is you're interested in and see if someone's published in that area. Um, in terms of content analysis, um, a really good book I recommend is Weber, Robert Weber, a basic content analysis. And, um, you know, this method we've been looking through is essentially content analysis. Um, our validation paper is the citation I would recommend. Uh, this, this validates it as a method um, using about four or five different ways of validating a, uh, a tool. Um, and uh, here are a couple of papers which, are, which I like. They're, they're good uses of the software. Um, so thank you and um, this is where we live uh, lexamanta.com and please contact us if if you need uh, any assistance or any more information okay thank you for that so three very interesting presentations which i can uh, see from uh, everything that's going on in the q a is sparking lots of interest lots of uh questions and so now uh we've got a little bit of time uh to discuss with those three speakers jack Stu, and andrew uh, and i'm gonna pose some questions uh to them so uh i can see jack you've put your video on hi uh Stu and andrew are you both there as well 
super late for Andrew over in Australia. Thanks. And there's, still yeah, here. hi, <laughs> you're still there. Let's see if we can keep you awake for a little bit longer. So there's been a few questions in the chat about pricing, and I think you've all been posting information about that. Everybody can just go to the relevant um, websites to get all of that kind of uh, information. But there's also been quite a few questions uh, around the issue of data confidentiality, encryption, where the data are stored and so on when they're using your tools. So I thought we'd start off with that question and ask in order of the presentations for each of you to speak a little bit about the safeguards that are in place to protect encrypt participant data, all of those issues, which I know that you've all thought about uh, a lot uh, and have deal dealt with. So Jack, can you start us off? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we built our tool for consultancies from, from day one. So this is a super front of mind issue for us. What we do is we enter into uh, NDAs and data processing agreements with all of our customers. We do the same with any third parties that we use. So um, OpenAI, Cohere, AWS, all bound by the same uh, data processing agreements. They basically say that they are not allowed to passively retain or train on any of your data. When you delete it from our platform, it's completely gone, including all of the backups. Um, and we've also encrypted everything as well at, at rest and in transit. Um, we've partnered with Vanta um, for our compliance, who are a compliance company who are helping us with our SOC 2 certification. And then finally, on top of that as well, we got we have quite an extensive business insurance package. So if in the worst case scenario, there was some kind of breach, we're covered up to a million dollars per uh, occurrence. So those are a kind of set of things that we do that we have in place. Um, and for context as well, we work with consultancies in healthcare and government as well. Okay, great. Thanks. Stu, how about Discover Text? How are you dealing with those things? A couple of different ways. For uh, federal agencies that use our software, they host it uh, on their federal cloud. So we're a GSA compliant uh, provider of software and services to the US federal government. They mostly use the software, 100% use it for sorting public comments and proposed regulations, which is the reason the software was originally developed. Uh, we have had private third parties with confidential hospital records uh, run our software in their cloud. So sometimes the government or the private sector assume the responsibility of the hosting in their local environment and the, so the software is running in their cloud essentially. Um, for the rest of y'all, <clears throat> my mom hates it when I say this in public, there's a server and disc array in my basement across from my laundry. It's been there for 10 years. It's, uh, it's a beast. We bought a good one when we needed it, and that's where Discover Text lives. So it's a cloud in my basement, which, by the way, the cloud is always in some basement or warehouse or facility. In terms of Protect, protecting uh, confidentiality and privacy of people's information. We work with a lot of Twitter data. So there, there is a lot of private information that people make public. And there's a huge ethical dilemma completely unresolved across most of academia of how to properly store and manage that. It's not just GDPR, it also has to do with compliance with the terms of service and things like that. In our case, what we do is we display Twitter data live inside uh, the system if it's been deleted or suspended you don't see it so we have a built-in safeguard against violating the twitter terms of service which may not matter now that elon musk is running twitter uh, he may not care what gets displayed or doesn't or done anywhere but we did build that kind of safeguard in so uh, in terms of uh, breaches or hacking attempts you know we're on the web since 2010 and uh, we've been secure since that time in all those three locations. Great, thanks, Stu. Andrew, over to you. Thanks, Christina. Um, yeah, so like some answer, I mean, it, it processes your data and we don't need to mix in. In fact, we don't want to mix in other data from foreign sources. Um, so, you know, the probably the most purchased copy is a desktop copy, which lives on your own machine. Um, you can pull out the network cable or turn off your Wi-Fi and it'll still work just fine. Um, so, you know, you can have it air-gapped if you want. And, you know, for some some agencies, that's what they do. And for, I'd say, most uh, academic researchers, uh, they get a desktop copy. 
Okay, great. So different situation for Leximancer there. Um, there's another question which kind of leads on from this, I think. So are the products learning from the data that we as researchers feed into them? And does that mean that you're profiting as a developer from our data? Um, so I guess, Andrew, from what you've just said, let's go to you first. Uh, not at all. No. Not, not even a little bit. Um, we don't. We don't aggregate or collect. We don't even like we do have a portal product for some people who who want uh, in the cloud. But even for that, um, we don't go in and and uh, look at their projects. And there's no. Uh, this is. It's not like. It's not like. Shouldn't pick on Chat GPT, but it's not like the large language models where it feeds into their learning. Um, we absolutely doesn't. Um, your projects live on your machine, um, or if you're in the cloud, they live in your your private folder, all the learning goes on inside the project and you see the results. That's it, full stop. Great, thanks. Stu, how about Discover Text? In that so respect? we've never used anybody else's projects or data for anything. Um, there is a capability for people to link their accounts together. That's part of the crowdsourcing and the annotation works in groups. But I'm completely unaware in the history of the product of any one group connecting to another group and sharing data across projects. I just don't think it happens. Uh, the fundamental design was to enable people to build machine learning models collaboratively and to share their training sets. And again, in the context of Twitter data, to store a single copy, be Twitter compliant, let many people build models rather than the standard academic model, which is everybody downloads it to their local instance and stores their own copy and then they share copies or they post copies and so uh, i i think that uh, when i hear about some of the ways in which data is being borrowed to build models uh, and some of the violations of the intellectual property of the creators of that that data i'm i'm quite appalled by what i see and we have no pardon in any of that okay thanks Jack, same question to you about the data that's uploaded. Are you learning from that? Uh, no, definitely not. Uh, we don't do any uh, training or, or passive retention on anyone's data, as I said. Um, we built for consultancies from the from the beginning, and that was like a really important um, core principle. So anything you put in our platform um, is, is private and secure. Um, and then once you delete it, it's all gone. So there's no like residual traces anywhere. Okay, great. Okay, so that was a question which spanned across the three of you. I'm now going to ask each of you a separate question about your own particular products that's come up. So start with Jack, you again, which was a question about how the themes in CoLoop are generated. The question was, is that to, uh, ha does that happen solely by frequency or by something else? I wonder if you can speak to that uh, more broadly. Yeah, so uh, the, the generation of themes are, the way it works is you ask questions or put in objectives and it will kind of isolate the themes um, in, in the sort of responses from those participants. So basically the way that happens is it's, it's based on how directly it answers the question, uh, how frequently it occurs and the sort of strength of language that the person's using. So um, maybe only one or two people said it, but maybe it was very direct and emphatic towards the point. And so that will kind of appear as a theme. Whenever we list all the themes in our analysis grids, they will be ranked in order of frequency by default. Um, but whether they show up or not will be based on um, those factors. Okay, great. Andrew, I'm going to come to you again now, uh, yeah. which is a question about whether Leximancer can be used to train based on years worth of historical data. So maybe that's a question about a longitudinal project or something like that so can mm. you build one project on previous projects and that it learns from that from the previous ones right i mean you i mean people people do longitudinal studies with laxaman so there's quite a few out there where they've they've picked a journal or a, a set of journals from a, a research uh, community and and done a you know decade by decade retrospective um so but the question is um I saw a comment in there that I, I was against human bias uh, in the Q&A. That's not true. I'm against uncontrolled and unknown bias. I mean, obviously, um, you can code data any way that suits your research question and your audience. Um, 
and there's a million ways to code any piece of qualitative data. Um, so I'm just uh, opposed to uncontrolled uh, bias that you're not aware of. Um, we used to call it systematic error in physics. Uh, it's not random error. It doesn't go away. And the more data you have and the more times you do it, it stays there and 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 kind of embarrasses you if you're not aware of it. Uh, so, you know, I'm not I'm not against human discretion at all. Um, so I say that because you, if you do incremental learning on your language model or your model or whatever it might be, then the past... So imagine this. I start feeding in year by year some text into a model. And first of all, you know, the first year, the second year doubles the amount. The third year, uh, you get, what, 30% more. But then the, after 15 years, you've got very little change. The model solidifies. It, it, so it's dominated by the past. And language changes over time. Um, you know, vocabulary changes. Uh, syntax can change. But, but you know, the semantics can really change. You know, 20 years ago, different things were happening, or 15 years ago, or in a fast-changing field, you know, like AI, five years ago is a very different landscape. So baking in the past into a model and using it on the present, is you have to be really cautious of that. Um, yes, you can do it in Lexvan. So you can, you can get a project, and there's a setting which you can say just, you know, um, don't... You can train the model on one set of data and then go in and use that thesaurus, that code book, on a different set of data. And it won't it won't wipe out your thesaurus. It will just code the new data. Um, so you can use it one data set, training, code another test data set. But but I just, you know, I caution about expecting semantics or even vocabulary to stay constant with time. And and the consequences of that can be unexpected. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Really detailed um, uh, answer. It raises the issue that we're always really interested in, isn't it, between the, what's t possible technically and what's appropriate methodologically. Yes, this is, um, so this is, this is a, I guess this is a hobby horse of mine. Um, we, sh we are scientists, right? We're not just engineers. And we shouldn't do, just do something because um, it's cool or we could do it. Um, we're scientists, and that's about selecting always selecting any experiment. What do I measure? What do I measure from the data? Anytime we step out the door, we choose what we measure in the world, right? And that's the the art and science of what we do. Um, and so, you know, we we choose what to measure. Lexamanta has an option to do grounded. So it tries to make a parsimonious model, which codes most of the data, but you can generally, you, you know, you can definitely change that. Um, so, you know, we need to think about why we do things. Um, yeah, I agree. Great, thanks. Okay, question for Stu, a long question. You may have touched on this in the chat, but anyway, here we go. We have had occasion where publicly shared surveys have been hijacked by rogue respondents submitting multiple responses, either to try to win a prize draw or to cause mischief. Manual review of the data allows us to spot these and clean the data set, but I would be worried that an AI analysis tool would miss them. Hmm. Um, how do you address this with your tool? Well, this is great because it allows me to add to Andrew's answer about large scale surveys as well, which is this is something we've had experience with that illustrates a general point, which I hope came through in the presentation, which is sometimes you build a tool for one reason, you find out it's useful for another and you had never intended. So large scale surveys, we've had quite a bit of experience with talking about tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of respondents. And the first thing we always do with them is clean. I'm gonna give away some trade secrets here. So in the spirit of openness that you mentioned, these are some of the most valuable things you can do with a survey of any scale. First of all, find all the duplicates and near duplicates. That's a plagiarism section technique. Uh, the duplicates tend to be short answers where people have, you know, little or nothing to say, or they'll literally write that they have nothing to say in a variety of ways, about 15 ways in English to sh shortly type that you have nothing to say. Uh, there's also short positives and short negatives that show up, and you can code these in very large numbers, tens of, at a time, hundreds at a time, even thousands at a time, and build models, machine learning models of short positives, short negatives. So if you get rid of all the duplicates that are really nothing to say, 
and you find all the short positives and the short negatives, it's a layered approach to cleaning the data, what you'll find is what's left over is, is what's worth looking at. And then you can begin other ways of diving into that data and doing analysis on it. Again, I would suggest the opposite of what I see a lot of people try to do, which is to put all of the data into all of the relevant categories simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Rather, we do red flag detection. So in hospitals, it's like practices that might cause harm or injury or death to a patient that are being directly reported. There might be 100,000 survey responses but in the 100,000 survey responses, there might only be 50 or 100 that are the absolute most important thing. And so if you approach qualitative research using tools and methods, it's not AI, right? Duplicate detection, near duplicate clustering, searching, filtering, keyword frequency, bigrams, trigrams. These are all information retrieval techniques that allow you to drill down into a pile and then maybe find something, like I always say, Watch out for frequency bias. Don't use word clouds or frequency counts as any kind of meaning indicator. That I think someone else mentioned it, that something might be rare, occurs once or twice, Jack, was it you maybe, in a large corpus, but it's the most important thing. And so there's not an AI that's going to look at 100,000 documents and say this one is the most important thing, right? It's going to have to take a series of steps where you get rid of the noise, get rid of the clutter, get rid of the common things, and then look at what's left. And then some of the things that display term frequency that allow you to do searches or filtering or machine learning models or human annotation, inductively and deductively, that'll get you to the first most important data. Then you do that and then you build the next model. And if you do this right, these models are reusable, right? If you, if you do it in a way it might not transfer, as, as Andrew says, cleanly over 15 years, right? But my biggest machine learning model has 2.1 million training items. I've been building it for four years it's based on Twitter bios. It predicts the likelihood that someone will support Donald Trump. That's it. And it, that composition of Twitter has changed over four years. Those bios have changed. They've evolved but we've added more and more data and you keep retraining the model and models can evolve. And that's one of the nice things about machine learning is a human can look at it and look at the results. Like I found a bunch today where the model completely got it wrong, clearly made false predictions, but a human needed to look at that and say, these ones were wrong. And by labeling those ones, my model gets better. The slam dunks that are actually false positives or false negatives. Okay, thanks, Stu. Jack, did you want to add anything to that conversation? Yeah, I think um, I, you know, I think I think it's uh, you know, it's it's really important to have the have the human in the loop throughout this process, and that's kind of the, at the core of like how we've built our tool. And you know, machine learning models and outputs really need to be um, interpretable, uh, and people need to be able to see like how they've reached reached a conclusion or raised something. Um, we had someone run a um, inkling community with us the other day, and uh, actually by using our tool because they were able to link to the sources, they found that there was somebody who just posted a bunch of copy and paste responses into a set of boxes which they might not have found uh, looking across a, I think, forty-something page spreadsheet with loads and loads of respondents. So, um, you know, I think the key thing is always just being able to relate back to the back to the data and always have a, a method to check these things. Okay, great. Thanks a Chris lot. Christina, can yeah. I just add to that? Um, yeah, please do. Yeah, I mean, yes, repetition. We see that fairly often with surveys. On a on a schema, like a conceptual schema map, you see, it, it's very clear when you get someone posting the same thing again and again. Um, you get this, it looks kind of like you get three big nodes with a very strong triangle between them and everything else fades into the background because you can get the same concepts overly frequently represented and connected. So you can see that very quickly. And then we have a setting, which is duplicate removal, which goes in and removes everything except the first one in that situation. So it is it is manageable. You can see it when it happens and you can fix it. Okay, great. So I just want to go back to the data privacy issue, partly because I know it's a big issue for many people, especially those uh, who are new to this whole thing. But there's a, a reflection here that leads on to a question, which I think is a, a really good one to put to the three of you. So 
Um, the repeated questions about data as privacy suggest that uh, the biggest IT challenge for adoption of these tools will be barriers from the research ethics committee, committees or institutional review boards, not actual security itself. Uh, so the question then is, are you developing plain language guides or crowdsource solutions for helping get through these kinds of hoops or processes? So how are you as developers helping us as researchers convince those who fund us or whatever to uh, that that um, that everything's secure and ethical? Um, who should I go to first? Just, Andrew. I'll, I'll chime okay. in and say that the people well, at universities who need to make those decisions usually do not have deep technical understanding of the systems and they are completely dependent on other people for explaining what it is they're regulating. And this has been a problem since the start of the internet. Yeah, so I, th I guess the question is that what what can you guys do as the developers to help in 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 communicating that? Jack? Yeah, um, I, I think I think that's a I think that's a uh, a really perceptive point. Um, I don't know if you made that one, but I think I think it is certainly true. Um, one thing you know I would point out is that all of us here are on Zoom. Um, Zoom a couple of weeks back uh, changed their own privacy policy to basically say that they were um, the data controller and owner for anything you ran through it and could basically do whatever they wanted with it. Um, it was a huge, there was a huge backlash and they U-turned on it. But um, to, to make the point, like at the drop of a hat, any service that you use online that collects your data could decide to do that at some point and it would be at your discretion to discontinue usage of them. I think the really important thing here is uh, to spread understanding and, and plain language guides. I've actually written a blog about this in our, our docs, which I'll post in the um, comments. And I think, yeah, as I say, like the key thing is just kind of uh, really making sure people understand uh, the differences with AI between inference and training, where your data resides and, and where the actual risks are. And I, I think that part of the kind of confusion here is probably around chat GPT as well. Um, OpenAI's stated aim as a company is to develop general intelligence. Um, the consumer tool ChatGPT is a product they are using to gather data in order to do that. They do have private business offerings, which um, services like us and uh, you know other folks here do make use of, which do not, uh, which are not for that purpose. They are um, they are paid, they are private, and um, they they don't retain your data for that purpose. So um, yeah, spreading understanding. Um, check out the blog article I've wrote. Um, we also have a community as well where we discuss these kind of issues and I've posted other videos about it there, which I'll link to you guys too. So, okay. so for us, it's just a matter of uh, if, you know, if ethics is an issue and it usually is, I mean, um, just you get the desktop copy of Lexam answer and then your data and your projects and all the derivatives are on wherever you put Lexam answer on, in, within your university or whatever, secure drive or, you know, so if you take your laptop home and lose it, well, that's, you know, that's, that's unfortunate, but yeah. 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 Great. Okay. Thanks guys. There's lots of other questions. I'm sure you can see them all, but I want to make sure that we keep on schedule today because we've still got uh, lots of other exciting uh, presentations to watch and conversations to have uh, today. Thank you very much to Jack, Andrew and Stu for now. Thank you guys. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you everyone. Christina. Uh, let's move on to our next developer presentation, uh, which uh, will be on the what, how and why of AI uh, in Max QDA. And that will be uh, with Dr. Stefan uh, Radica. Uh, and Stefan has uh, a keen interest in pedagogy in research methodology and in software development. And he's combined these three specialisms over the past 20 plus years in his work with Professor Udo Kukart, who originally invented Max QDA, and Verbi, who are the company who now manufacture the software in Berlin, Germany. Stefan performs several roles for the company. Uh, for many years in the past, he was the chief technolo technology officer 
Uh, and today he runs numerous training events and publishes very widely on methods and tools. He also contributes to the development of Max QDA in an ongoing capacity, as well as running his own methods consultancy. So stopping my share now, and uh, we'll look forward to watching your presentation, Stefan. <laughs> A warm welcome to my presentation, the what, why and how of qualitative AI in MaxQDA. MaxQDA is a desktop app that allows to analyze your data in many different ways. You can code it, you can write memos, you can summarize it or visualize it, you can present your data and you can even perform mixed methods data analysis. Typical data involves interviews and focus groups, Many users analyze documents and surveys, or they import social media data like YouTube comments, or they import literature to perform a literature review. As of November 23, there are four kinds of AI power tools included in MaxQDA. There is automatic transcription, there is topic modeling, there is sentiment analysis, and there is summarizing and paraphrasing and the development of codes using the well-known large language model GPT offered by OpenAI. So let's have a closer look to all of those features and how you can use them and why they have been implemented. Automatic transcription allows you to upload audio or video files, select from more than 45 languages, and the interesting thing is that you can also add your own vocabulary here to ensure accurate transcription of rare words. And you can even include in brackets the pronunciation of a word. So, for example, for today's session, it might be interesting to include QDA software here. The result is an transcript like this, for example, with speaker diarization, and there is also recognition of pauses. Here, for example, a dot for a second pause. Why has this been implemented and what's the, what is the methodological impact? So we see, of course, transcription as a very time consuming task and it makes sense to make this easier. And the developments in recent years show that the automatic transcription features are very well here and we could implement that here. So the data exploration already starts while you're checking the transcripts for accuracy. And uh, yeah, you can skip some time here of tedious transcription. Topic modeling allows to analyze a large corpus of documents and to I statistically identify patterns of words. For example, here within very short 6,000 documents, we could identify the topics reporting, guidance for patients, because there are typical words that occur together here. And there is another topic, number six, that we can currently name here, which we consists of several words. So topic modeling is very typical for the stage of data exploration. And it enhances this data exploration because it allows us to cope with a large text corpus that we weren't able to read in a yeah, let's say sense-making time. Sentiment analysis allows to identify the sentiments usually within short segments. For example, here are the answers to open-ended questions. So by analyzing the sentiments and autocoding the segments with the sentiments, we can identify those segments that have or that share similar sentiments. For example, here the positive ones, we can sort them. And here we can start analyzing from positive to negative because simply by sorting them, uh, the segments by sentiments, the similar sentiments are, yeah, are sorted, uh, are grouped together. So this is a typical task for evaluation and this pre-sorting allows us for, to focusing on different parts of the data and increasing the quality of our analysis. Let's come to the recent developments here because the GPT model allows us to include summarization in many ways here in MaxQDA. For example, summarizing uncoded text, which typically happens 
at the first stage of analysis. For example, here in interview with Matteo, I um, select the second paragraph here and I can summarize this automatically into a paraphrase. So it is paraphrased into a, this short passage is paraphrased into a much shorter passage here and much shorter summary here. But you are not limited to only summarize short passages. You can highlight also longer passages like this one and it's, uh, the, the highlight is going down a lot more. And then the summary can be created as a memo here and you can so this means you can summarize a passage or you can summarize the whole document. Please note that again here as in the paraphrase before this AI generated content is tagged as such so we have the, uh, the heading here AI summary. So this has been implemented because we think that summarizing is an important part of data exploration and it helps to gain an overview. You often get new insights and perspectives on a text or a passage. For example, in the summary there is an aspect you have overseen or there is an aspect uh, pronounced that you weren't aware of. You can also summarize already coded text, meaning that you have, for example, here all segments from 12 interviews on the topic workplace and career. And there are many options how you can now ask for a summary. You can set the language, you can set the length, meaning shorter, standard or longer. And you can combine this with the option text and bullet points, meaning that you can switch between a paragraph style or a bullet point style. And you can restrict this by selecting only activated documents to specific cases or specific groups of cases. The result is again tagged as AI summary, as you can see here. And this is now a summary for segments of one topic. While you can create an overall summary, you can also create summaries for each coded segment, like this one here. These are automatically created during import from a survey. 48 coded segments. Why would you spend more time on something? And you can create automatically these uh, summaries for each single answer allowing us to get a, a quick overview of all the answers here. And please note that again, here we have AI colon as an indicator that this has been created automatically. Of course, you can change it here within the comments field. Then there is also in the idea of the summary grid in MaxQDA, allowing to concentrate on the person, on a person or on a specific document and to concentrate on a specific topic for this person. For example, here are the answers of Riley on the question on how a typical workday looks for, for Riley. And MaxQDA allows to summarize these, these three segment, segments that are displayed here into an automatically created summary here. So here we are creating not a summary overall for a topic, but a summary on a topic per case. So these summary options for coded text <clears throat> add a second layer to our data, which is very useful for a category development for quick data access because you don't have to look at the whole segment again, but sometimes only work with these short summaries and you can uh, yeah, jump back to the original data anytime. So these also support survey analysis. They allow rapid analysis and I could make this list a little uh, longer here. MaxQDA also allows to develop codes from the material inductively. For example, think of starting your analysis, data exploration or open coding situation in grounded theory or another approach. And we have here a short question like how many domestic responsibilities do you have and how do you share them with your partner and a very short answer here. And for this answer, MaxQDA can generate new codes, suggestions like this list here. So you see there's a long list here. We have thematic codes like division of household responsibilities. We have more thematic codes, which are usually a little bit more abstract like gender roles and responsibilities. And we have interpretative codes, which is very interesting because 
It brings another perspective here to the data. For example, perceptions of cleanliness and tidiness. So there is another approach here allowing you to create inductively codes. Here the idea is that you're not working with a single segment, but with all the segments, for example, coded for friends and family. Here 41 segments. MaxQDA will present a list of subcodes that you might create here for this friends and family category, including here limited time for family and friends and an explanation from the data. Um, yeah, it's kind of a data extraction here. What uh, belongs to this category here, to this subcode suggestion? Please note that every time you call this feature here, this specific subcode suggestions, you will get different results. The idea is that um, it is like an assistant, like uh, when you, we meet and we look at the data again, we might come up to another idea. And if you ask another person, you will end up with another subcode suggestions because subcodes, yeah, subcodes are not, there is no 100% right or wrong for uh, subcodes, even only some better suited or less suited. And so MaxQDA gives you several ideas and how you can construct your subcodes there. We think this is important because this is a very important and crucial analytical task in qualitative research and it extends the viewpoints and elaborates, uh, elaborates the analysis. It also works on the interpretation level, which makes it very interesting, I guess. Some final remarks and conclusions. So you can use MaxQD AI feature in research practice all over the course of a research project from data preparation and reporting uh, to reporting. And it does not matter if you're doing a literature review or document analysis or doing strategic foresight, you can use them and apply them to your project there. So what are the principles that lie behind this AI implementation? So I want to point out two things. The first thing is that, as you have seen, AI is implemented as an assistant. It is not a replacement for researchers' judgment here. Uh, in fact, it, I think there is more need for researchers' judgment here. And it is offered as an option, not as a mandate, meaning that you can, for one segment, apply AI summary, for the next you don't have to. And it is some kind of flexibility here. And there is transparency. I, uh, that's why I highlighted so often that here these generated segments or this generated um, output is highlighted as AI uh, generated. And there is a lot of customizability and integration. So you can adjust the summary function, for example, to your specific needs. Um, you can call it usually by right click. And please note that you can alter and edit the summaries and many other created data anytime. So it's just a suggestion. It's, it's not, yeah, it's not the, the final result that you're getting here, but you're getting inspirations, you're getting ideas. And this brings me to some methodological reflections, some impacts on research. So first of all, I think there is an increase in efficiency and effectivity because we are shifting the focus from tedious tasks like automatic transcription to the core qualitative analysis. Or at least there is the chance to do this. I want to raise the question if these AI tools yeah, some kind lead to the end of thematic coding. I'm not sure about this, but do we really need thematic coding then when we can summarize it for specific topics or so? Or yeah, it's, it's an interesting question here, I guess. And I'm happy to hear your thoughts on this. And I want to point out here that the tools that I've shown here can work as an inspiration a priori, or they can work a posteriori as a quality check. So, and there might be more stages here, and you can also combine these stages here, but I think it's important to notice that um, we can use the tools at different stages in our analysis. And last but not least, I want to point that there might be a rise of image of qualitative research, maybe in the eyes of quantitative research, because there is now more transparency ETC. We'll see. So 
Thank you so much for your attention and happy research. Thank you so very much to Stefan for that presentation. And we'll come back uh, with some questions uh, to you. Uh, but we're going to move on to our final um, presentation from a qualitative software developer this afternoon, uh, which is going to be uh, from um, Norman Pelado, who is the president and CEO of Privalis Research, which is a software company based in Montreal in Canada. Uh, Norman has a doctorate in psychology and more than 35 years experience as a social science researcher and as a consultant in research methodology for large corporations, government agencies and international organizations. Via his company, Provalis Research, Norman develops a number of different software products, including SimStat, which is a statistical analysis software, QDA Miner, which is a qualitative and mixed methods analysis software, as well as WordStat, which is what he's going to speak about primarily today in the context of our topic about the what, how and why of AI. So I will let him in his pre-recorded video tell us all about WordStat. Uh, but as well as developing these software programs, Norman has trained thousands of researchers in text analysis techniques, techniques in many different contexts around the world uh, over the years. Answering the question why we implemented AI in WordStat should be obvious to most WordStat users. We often say that necessity is the mother of invention, but I would argue that laziness is the real mother of invention. And any software development that helps produce the time and effort required to perform a task is a useful and welcome development. We all know that qualitative analysis is time consuming to the point where as soon as the volume of data become too important, qualitative analysis become unsuitable. This is why user having to deal with large amount of text data choose WordStat over QD Manor or will use QD Manor machine learning feature to assist their qualitative coding task. WordStat offer three alternative techniques to deal with such large amount of text. Qualitative content analysis, which consists of applying dictionaries to measure a specific topic or concept. But building one's own dictionary can be quite time consuming, so any assistance the software can provide will be welcome. Exploratory text mining, attempt to identify automatically topics or patterns using unsupervised machine learning and statistical methods. It should produce meaningful results and ensuring usefulness and accuracy of those results is crucial and requires a lot of testing and adjustment. Automatic document classification consists of using supervised machine learning to categorize documents into mutually exclusive classes. It may also require a lot of experimentation to achieve optimal performance. We have thus explored over the years how natural language processing and AI technique can be useful for speeding up the development of dictionary and for optimizing the performance of automatic exploration and document classification. Answering the question of how brings me to a distinction between two basic approaches used by software developers. The first approach is what I would call the quick and easy way of integrating AI. It consists of using existing library, whether commercial or open sources, or licensing existing service. The benefits are quite clear. You don't need to be an expert in the domain and integrating those technology can be done very quickly. But there are, in my opinion, several disadvantages of such an approach. Having no domain expert is often associated with the lack of understanding of the underlying assumption behind those techniques, which may result in misapplication. And since there's no real or only limited assessment of performance, chances are the results are less than optimal. We should also mention the potential recurring costs associated with commercial solution, which will, in the end, be passed to the end user. But for me, one major disadvantage is the dependence of the software company to the provider, which may decide to increase its price, go bankrupt, or lose its competitive advantage over other players. The second approach, the hard way, is probably what best describes our approach to new technology. We try instead to become experts, understand the underlying assumptions, learn about the potential as well as the limits of those techniques, test them before implementing them ourselves. This allows us to make sure those techniques are relevant to our users. It also allows us to innovate and sometimes obtain results that are better than what may be considered state-of-the-art in the industry. We can also adapt some of those technology to new applications they have not been designed for. And finally, it allows us not to rely on solution provider. 
but of course there are major inconvenience to this approach. You need to acquire expertise of those highly technical domains or you need to hire experts in those domains. The testing and optimization often take a lot of time and effort. What could take a few weeks to implement by licensing existing technology may take months or even years to develop internally. Also, while there are no recurring costs, the initial research and development costs can be much higher. Let me start by giving you a simple example of the benefit of such an approach. We have been using a third-party component from a company named Addictive Software for offering spelling correction in Kidimana and Wordstat. We needed some additional features, and we also wanted to implement a fully automated spelling correction. For that, we need a component that could bring the right words at the top of the suggestion list as often as possible and as quickly as possible. But a company who developed this component no longer exists, so we decided to look at some alternative, but we were also considering implementing our own spelling engine. But to test the performance of alternative solution, we need to compare them. For this, we need some benchmark, and we found two spelling correction benchmark, and we created a third one based on some data we had. We test two often used library. Applying the benchmark allow us to see that while both had decent performance in terms of retrieving the correct words in the suggested list, they were not as good as addict at bringing this correct word at the top position, which is very important if you want to automate spelling correction. All of them were quite slow when dealing with large amount of misspelled words. So we start writing our own engine, and with a lot of trial and error, we were able to improve the accuracy of the top suggestion. But more importantly, we were able to greatly increase the speed of the engine, allowing us to offer almost instantaneous spelling correction on a large dataset. But having developed our own engine also allow us to do things that would have been difficult or impossible to do with existing library. The engine we built is now able to perform spelling correction in unknown words that are not in a spelling dictionary. We also needed to retrieve words matching specific patterns, for example, all words starting with the same set of letters. Now, let us look at a more contemporary AI technique, topic modeling, a technique that relies on unsupervised machine learning, and see how we implemented that in WordSet. To perform topic modeling, you ask a computer to read a large amount of text and identify a specific number of topics, say 10, 20, or 50 topics. In a matter of seconds, sometime after a few minutes, it will bring you a list of words, each corresponding to a topic. This is an example of a topic modeling performed using LDA, which was considered for many years as a state-of-the-art topic modeling technique. Some topics are good, others may be harder to guess. Word in reds are words that appear in more than one topic. Since words are often polysemous or are used in different contexts, this is to be expected. However, many words appear in way too many topics. In this example, we had some words appearing in 9, 10, and up to 15 topics, Sometimes a word will even appear in more than half of the topic. We did implement our own topic modeling technique using a very different approach, and we obtained what we considered to be a better topic. But also, we had a lot of fewer overlapping words, some words appearing in two, sometimes three, but barely more than four topics. Subjectively, we considered our approach better, but it would be hard not to be biased and not believe that we were better than the other. For this reason, we partnered with researchers in the Computer Science Department at Concordia University in Montreal to perform an independent evaluation of our technique and LDA. On three different benchmarks, humans were asked to judge the coherence of the sets of words produced by those topic techniques. And on two of the datasets, topic extract with words that were considered as generally better than those obtained using LDA. On only one data set, the difference favored LDA, but the results were not consistent and not statistically significant. But LDA was developed 20 years ago, and many new techniques have been proposed since then, some of them using deep learning technique, some combining word embedding or a large language model, such as BERT or GPT, in order to get better results. So we needed to test those and possibly identify what would be worth implementing. So I asked one of my researchers to identify newer promising techniques in order to test those. He identified five more recent techniques and designed a benchmark using three datasets. We then generated a total of 286 topic models and compute various metrics used in computer science to assess the coherence of topic solution, the diversity of those solutions, as well as their stability. Since the main objective is to optimize both coherence and diversity, I present you the results on the graph where the best method should be plotted in the upper right corner. Green square are used to represent the two worst set methods. 
LDA here is represented with the blue dot, while the other techniques are represented either by a green triangle or a red diamond. I must say that we were quite surprised ourselves with the results. Our hope was to find ways to improve our product, but results shows instead that we were already beating all the other techniques. On the first graph, coherence was assessed using Wikipedia as the external reference datasets. But results were even much clearer when assessing how good our approach was at describing the relationship in the corpus itself. Our methods were also much more stable than the other approaches. Now, since our objective of this experiment was to find ways to improve ourselves, technically speaking, I can say that this experiment was a total failure. This didn't prevent us from being pleased by such results, but we needed to look elsewhere for ways to improve our topic modeling. One way we thought could help us improve topic modeling results was trying to perform automatic word sense disambiguation on topic solution, something that to our knowledge has never been done before. Words are polysemous in nature, and while topic modeling does recognize this, it deals with it in a less than ideal way. Here's an example of two topics from a dataset of review written by airline passenger. In such a context, the word leg has two different meanings, the passenger leg and the space or lack of space available for those, and two, a flight segment when the trip involves a connection or when it refers to the inbound or outbound segment of a trip. While topic modeling may successfully recognize the two concepts, it will not try to differentiate the meaning based on the context, but instead simply associate different probabilities to those two topics when the word appears. A better approach for us would be to disambiguate this word and assign one to the appropriate topic and zero to the other one. One way to achieve this is to identify a phrase containing the ambiguous words and deciding for a specific topic whether those phrases are relevant or not relevant, or what they call in computer science through positive or false positive. To achieve this, we did a lot of experiment. We first start by adopting a supervised machine learning approach and tested on three datasets different dichotomization technique, co-occurrence metrics, and computation methods. Overall, we end up comparing about 432 machine learning results. We then start experimenting with word embedding, which is a deep learning technique used to represent semantic relationship of words in a large corpus of text. We first test the performance on three embedding methods, pre-train on two very large corpora, and apply it on three datasets using various computation methods for a total of 324 experimental results. We also compute more than 32,000 corpus train embedding, also varying the embedding settings such as the vocabulary size and dimension of the embedding. All of those experiments allow us to identify the best methods across various conditions and improve the performance for our word sense disambiguation. Now, let me show you the results of such efforts. This is what a typical topic modeling looks like if you use Python or R library. It will typically be a list of words with associated statistics. Now, let me show you what topic modeling looks like in the current version of WordStat. Using word sentence ambiguation technique, we bring a list of phrases that are related to the topic. Those phrases improve the measurement of the topic, but it also makes their interpretation a lot easier. We also name topic automatically, allowing the user to immediately put the results to a cluster analysis or a cross tab to perform statistical comparison. We also added a suggestion tab, and when you access this tab, you will be presented with additional phrases that may be added to the topic. You will also get potential exception consisting of phrases containing a topic word, but associated with a different context, potentially false positive. We also identified potential misspellings of words contained in this topic. The testing we did on NLP and AI technique also allow us to improve the assistance one gets when building dictionary. From the very first version of WordStat, one could get a list of synonyms, antonyms, and related words, allowing one to group them together in the category of a content analysis dictionary. But those suggestions rely on the use of a thesaurus, which may not be available in some human language. Also, technical terms specific to a specialized area may not bring any suggestion. This example shows the synonyms and the related words for the word entertainment. All of those words are in the existing datasets of airline reviews we are analyzing, but they originate from an English thesaurus. But if we use AI and advanced NLP technique, we can get suggestions even if we don't have a thesaurus. So technically, it should work in almost any language. If we look at the results we obtain, we can see that most of the words are either semantically identical or closely related to the context in which the word entertainment appear. Even more interesting is that it also suggests words like IFE, VERA, and AVOD that may be unknown to most of us, 
but a quick look at where those words appear allow us to see that IFE stand for in-flight entertainment, AVOD for audio video on demand, and VERA is the name of the entertainment system in Virgin Atlantic aircraft. Similar suggestion can also be obtained on phrases extract by Wordstat. In this example, selecting friendly and helpful bring a lot of phrases that basically mean the same thing. A lot of those phrases include the word friendly or helpful, but many suggested phrases contain neither one of these, like polite and courteous, or attentive and professional. Those are pure AI-generated suggestions. Exploring how AI and NLP technique can help is one way to achieve this. But another element people should consider is that AI, just like human, is often used in a way that mimics the same type of cognitive bias we humans suffer from. Supervised machine learning is susceptible to confirmation bias. Automatic summarization tools are designed to perform selective reading and are prone to anchoring bias. Recommender systems used by social media platforms also exemplify the grouping phenomenon and tend to create echo chamber. Neural network techniques are also sensitive to ordering effect and may be sensitive to both primacy and recency effect, and in some setting may even result in some form of loss aversion bias. This is why I believe a more knowledgeable approach to AI is important. I'm not sure we should ask the user to understand those limits. I think it is the responsibility of the software developer to inform their users of such limits or design tools that minimize them. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So we're going to have a little bit of a discussion now. So hopefully, Stefan, you will put your video back on and we'll spotlight you as well. Great. Thank you. Hi. Thanks a lot. OK, I thought I'd start in the same place that we started with the previous discussion, uh, because in the chat have been um, the very important uh, data storage, confidentiality, privacy question. So I'm just going to pose the same question to you two as we started off earlier, which is to do with the safeguards that are in place uh, through your products about uh, participant data. So Stefan, can I start with you? Yeah, you can hear me, I guess. Okay, so yeah, um, yeah. basically it takes it uh, yeah, very important to think about the compliance with GDPR and so on, because we're dealing often with interviews, we're dealing with, uh, with data from our participants where we are sure that there is uh, data protection, there is data security. So uh, none of the data is stored somewhere, none of it is used for training. It is, um, yeah, there was the question on if we can trust, for example, OpenAI, if we have an NDA and if we have uh, the zero retention, how it is called policy, which means that send the data, get the result, the send data is deleted there. So yeah, this is how it works and this is how it is built. And it is, I see it completely and it is assured that it is completely GDPR compliant and compliant with all other uh, yeah, big important uh, laws, let's say here. And for example, let's take automatic transcription. For automatic transcription, Users need to upload something to a model and it is transcribed with a server in Europe. It is the, the media file is not saved. It is deleted immediately after 10 minutes of listening to it. It is not used for training and, and this is how it is going and yeah, how it is working now. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Norman. I could. Uh... Yeah, okay. I could basically give the same answer Andrew gave because we have a desktop tool, uh, not uh, so, so someone could, could run it uh, without being connected to the internet. Actually, we, we don't use any resource from the internet except in a very small exception when, when we do geocoding and, and, and asking for maps where we send a geographic location asking for maps that, that corresponds to those locations. Those are the only thing that, that get transferred out of, uh, uh, for the system. Otherwise, the software can be used uh, for the military secret computer, which happened quite a lot uh, in our case, but also on, on uh, in a private company, on, on a desktop computer not connected to the internet. Uh, uh, and, and there's no limit in functionality except for the geocoding part and mapping part uh, when you uh, when you work uh, either on an airplane or in a distant region where there's no internet. 
Great. Okay. Thanks a lot for that. Okay. We're going to talk about something completely different now. Okay. Because there's a question that's come through uh, in the chat, which I think is a really interesting one to put to you both. So do these platforms allow for collaboration across teams, individuals, organizations? For example, some analyses may require more than one researcher to uh, perform the analysis. So can you each speak a little bit to that team working collaboration aspects of your tools? Stefan, I'll come to you first as well. Yeah, so there is a, there are a lot of t uh, teamwork possibilities within MaxQDA, and there are uh, the, there are ones that are completely independent from any online tools or something that are completely working offline. So you can include and merge projects. You can uh, transfer data from uh, different projects to uh, from one project to another. You can share them, um, yeah, in in an offline way. Let's call it. And so it is possible to share, for example, the cases you're working on or the codes, the themes, the topics you're working on between yeah, any um, number of team members. This is the one way how it works. And the other way how it works is that there is a so-called team cloud, which allows me to upload a project there to share it with our my teammates. They can work on it independently from mine and they upload it again and I can download it again. So it's some kind of a sharing point here, like you are familiar with Microsoft SharePoint there, but it's not um, you know, light collaboration here, but it is uh, for working in cycles, we call it, because it is it is taking the idea of how we usually work in qualitative research. So I start something or we start something together. Everybody's working on their own, for example, on some topic, for example, on some uh, themes and, and and some cases, and then we merge it back together in a joint session. Okay, great. Thanks. Norman, how about team working in your tools? Yeah, well, um, team working is crucial when you do qualitative research, and, and uh, we did implement in, in Kitty Manor, not Wordstat. Well, in Wordstat, there are some provision to merge things together, but it's mainly in Kitty Manor that, that we do uh, we did implement uh, um, ways to collaborate and have several people working on the same project. Uh, recently, we tried to automate that, but we tried to automate that in a way that does not require a cloud-based solution. Well, uh, actually, um, uh, before, like 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 many other tools before, what, what we were doing is that, okay, you create multiple users, you create copies, you distribute copies, you retrieve copies, and then you you, you merge them. Uh, which can be prone to error because there's a lot of steps here. And what we did uh, more recently is that we tried to automate that. But we, we tried to automate that by allowing people to either use a, um, a, a, um, a internet uh, um, synchronized drive like uh, Dropbox or, or OneDrive, etc. But they can also use up internally a, a network drive. So, so basically the software will actually push all the copies will actually monitor changes to the copies and will bring them automatically and, and integrate them. And it will import uh, new codes. If they are new codes, it will import a coding. It will import new documents or new cases, uh, new variables as well, and any new report as well. And all of that is customizable. So, so this is for QD Mono. For WordSat, it uh, fits a little bit more tricky because it's less often the case that you will have many people working at the same time because what uh, QD Mono could require several weeks or months to do, words that can actually, a single person can probably do that in, in a single day. Uh, so that there's a, a less need of collaboration, except maybe for, for dictionary building. And for dictionary building, uh, we implemented a simple merge that allowed people to Im import merge and the software will actually identify what is there or not and, and, and then allow people to merge uh, two dictionaries that have been done. So, uh, but otherwise, words that typically people will, uh, if a single person can actually do uh, most of the analysis without any, because it it can actually analyze large amount of text pretty quickly. If it won't take weeks or or, or months, it can take uh, minutes or maybe a couple of hours. Okay. Great, thanks. Okay, I think we've got time just for one more question each uh, for you before we move on to our next session. Uh, so um, I want to ask this question of you, Stefan. Uh, with Microsoft Copilot just around the corner, mm -hmm. do you see this as a competitor for some of the functions in your tool or will it make people more comfortable using AI 
generally and therefore be more open to the tools that you're developing within your software? I think this is not an or, right? It is an, okay. an and maybe here because uh, let's take the first part of this, this this thinking or this statement. The first part is that, uh, yeah, that I don't see yeah, Microsoft Copilot or any other globally active, uh, yeah, let's say, yeah, AI tool, which has a very generative purpose here, is something that is challenging us in QDA software because it is so specific what we're doing here and we're delivering options how to use co-pilot ideas within a qualitative research project. And so there, I don't see any competition here. And in fact, I would agree that uh, these recent developments like that offers chat GPT to us, like creating images that offers other AI tools here, like for example, suggestions that I get somewhere that are streamlining the expectations or raising expectations and habits, how we interact with software and how we interact with data and something similar. So yes, I think that it will make it more, it will help or to, or, and it will you know, bring up new ideas how to work with the software and what to expect from the software. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. A slightly different question for you, Norman, if you don't mind. Um, in your presentation, you told us about lots of different tools within WordStat, and you've also talked a little bit about QDA Minor. There are lots of uh, options out there in, in, in this space that we're talking about today. And I just wondered whether you could very briefly comment uh, or if you've got any uh, ideas about which of those tools are used more frequently amongst your users. So for example, do commercial companies who use your product, are they more likely to use topic modeling than academics or something like that? So is there a relationship between the type of tool and the type of qualitative researcher, if that makes sense? Do you have a, an idea about that? Well, uh, one thing for sure is that worse that is definitely quite, uh, uh, worse that more popular among large companies and government agencies. Uh, Kudimana would be useful from the commercial side, would be more uh, useful by, by market researchers who are typically doing interviews, focus group transcripts, and when they do survey, they do small survey. And this is typically the, the, the quantity of text also depends a lot on which tool you will use. And this is basically the first question we ask when someone uh, approach us and they wanted to look at a solution for text analysis. We ask them, okay, what kind of data you have? And what quantity of data you have, and how much, and how much resource you have, because some people may have quite a lot of, of, of data, but they still want to do manual coding, even if they have, say, uh, uh, surveys with twenty thousand or or thirty thousand uh, people. Uh, we did implement some tools in Kidamanar to help that, so that uh, someone could could actually speed up the coding. Uh, so it's more both supervised and unsupervised machine learning in uh, QDMonitor, but in QDMonitor, it's more computer assistance than uh, trying to automate things. Uh, words that we have, for example, we have an airline company, they have something like 100,000 comments per month. Uh, so it's more than a million per year, and they want to see why people are satisfied or not. And they will, dip it, they will definitely not use something like like uh, like uh, like QDMonitor. They will prefer to use a tool like WordStat and to do topic modeling. And, and sometimes they will build dictionaries. Uh, I would say that uh, for, for, in terms of academic also, the discipline also uh, um, uh, plays a lot. So for example, um, we found that people in political science uh, are, are, are typically analyzing larger amount of text quite often, uh, people in communication as well. So, so those people will do topic modeling. And, and, and when we look at Google Scholar, th this is very biased toward academics. So <laughs> because companies don't, don't publish on, <laughs> on uh, uh, fin academic journals very rarely. So, uh, but, but we know that there's a lot of people doing topic modeling because they are analyzing policies, they are analyzing speeches, they are analyzing a large amount of text. And there's a lot of, of social scientists now who have access to a large amount of text. So they, they have a choice either of doing a small selection of, uh, of those texts and trying to do a quantitative analysis, but uh, another solution would be to try to tangle this large amount and then they would prefer to use WordStat. But quite often they will combine those. 
so you're talking about how we're choosing the tools appropriate to the method right which i think is something that we've we've I think I can probably say with confidence that we all think that that's an important thing. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we could carry on this conversation for a lot longer, um, but we've run out of our time together, uh, the three of us today, um, but we will be collating the rest of the questions and we'll be chatting about how to move that conversation forward. For now, thank you very much to all of our developer presentations. Um, uh, hopefully they will hang on because I'm sure they're going to be very interested in our next session uh, in which uh, my colleague, Sarah, who has just turned on her video, is going to introduce us to uh, our methodologists this afternoon and have a conversation with uh, them about the methodological implications of, of some of the things that we've been hearing about so far today. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much. That's great. Uh, so we have got with us two methodologists who will hopefully be spotlighted, Silvana de Gregorio and Susanna Frieza. Let's wait for them to be there with us. Fantastic. Hi, welcome everyone to this next session of the symposium. My name is Sarah Bullock and I work alongside Dr. Christina Silva at the Cactus Networking Project at the University of Surrey in the UK. So in this session, we are hoping to discuss the developments of AI technology, but in relation to research methodology. And I have the pleasure of being joined today by Dr. Silvana de Gregorio and Dr. Susanna Frieza. Both are very experienced researchers and methodologists, and both have a long-standing interest in software for the analysis of qualitative and mixed materials. Dr. Silvana de Gregorio is a sociologist and a former academic. She's been training, consulting, and publishing about qualitative data analysis software since 1995. And for 16 years, she had her own training and consulting business, SDG Associates. Sylvania is the author of Voice to Text Automating Transcription and Using Web 2.0 Tools for Qualitative Analysis. She's also co-authored Qualitative Research Design for Software Users qualitative research and technology in the midst of a revolution and tools for qualitative analysis. Currently, Silvana is product research director and head qualitative research, heads up the qualitative research branch at Lumavero, the developers of Envivo. Thanks so much for joining us today, Silvana. It's great to have you here. Um, Dr. Susanna Frieser has over 30 years of experience in qualitative methods and data analysis and started working with software for qualitative data analysis in 1992. She has extensive experience as well, training, consulting, and publishing about qualitative data analysis software. And she's held positions at the Institute of Marketing at the Copenhagen Business School in Denmark, the Sociology Department at Leibniz, University of Hanover, and the Max Planck Institute in Göttingen. Susanna is the author of the book, Qualitative Data Analysis with Atlas TI, as well as numerous other publications on the use of software tools and methodology. And Susanna is founding director at Kaludra, an AI powered application designed for qualitative data analysis. Welcome Susanna. So it's really great to have you both uh, with us today. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on a number of different topics regarding the use of AI and methods uh, in qualitative research. So let's turn to the body of what we would like to talk about today. So it might be said, I suppose, that we are in the midst of some considerable technological shifts um, and some details of these we've heard about from developers and also from participants earlier today. And it's clear that the research community faces some questions around how to navigate these. So perhaps as a starting point for our conversation today, it might be helpful to remember that this is probably not the first time that considerable technological shifts have occurred uh, and that uh, placing what is happening now in a historical context uh, might be helpful. So maybe, uh, Silvana, if you could start for us by reflecting on major developments that the community has previously navigated uh, that are helpful to bear in mind in relation to this. Right. Could I, could I have my slide, please? Yes, you can. Here it comes. 
Right. So this slide shows some of the technologies that have been available to researchers over the past hundred years. But the first technology we use goes back much, much further, and that is writing. Um, Plato records that Socrates argued that writing would lead to forgetfulness, as people would not rely on their memory, where he believed true knowledge resided, but on the written word, which he thought was secondhand knowledge. And he believed that writing gave you access to information without really understanding it. And this apprehension about new technology, you can see down the ages as scholars who have tried and tested ways of doing research are suddenly confronted with the new. Um, but you still need to, to, I still want to say that you need to have a critical eye um, when um, confronted with, with new technology, with new tools, you know, whether you fit the tool to the method, whether you fit the method to the tool, whether you develop new methods, do you reject the tool, do you develop new tools? And why do we use tools? And it's really to manage the limitations of our brain power. So in relation to qualitative data and analysis, the problems that researchers are trying to solve are how to manage and organize unstructured data or information, how to retrieve specific data that's been collected, how to find patterns in that data or information, and how to incorporate new forms of information which itself has been generated by new technologies. So in this slide, you see both um, technologies that were available in the last hundred years, as well as some of the leading influencers involved with qualitative research during those periods. And I first of all want to apologize that this is very much English language centric and very much American centric. Um, uh, but we don't have time to cover everything. So my, my apologies there. Um, and also that, you know, the most of the influencers um, didn't use the new um, technology that was available to them at the time. There's sort of like a time lag issue as well. And it's important to remember that up until the 1990s, there were very few books or articles that discussed the practicalities of doing qualitative research. Um, for me, Laughlin and Laughlin, the first edition, 1971, was my personal guide as um, a student in the 1970s. But I want to focus on the tape recorder, which became available to a wider public in the 1960s. And before the advent of the tape recorder, fieldwork and observations were dominant as qualitative data collecting techniques. Um, look at the work of Margaret Mead, William Foote White, you know, Street Corner Society. There's a whole load of um, um, studies like that during that time period. And also that diaries, letters, legal documents, newspapers were also important sources of, of data. Um, but what the tape recorder did, it enabled the capture of verbatim speech, and that ushered in the dominance of the interview as the primary mode of data, data collection and the decline of observation methods. And I still believe, well, from surveys that I've done, that the interview is still the dominant mode of data collection amongst qualitative researchers. Um, and um, the, but the thing with the tape recorder is that it also enabled new forms of data analysis. So um, in the 1960s, Harvey Sachs was working at a suicide counseling hotline where calls were recorded and he realized that he could analyze conversations. And together with Emanuel Shegloff and Gail Jefferson, they developed a new approach to analysis, conversation analysis. And that's something that was not possible before tape recorders. So the technology actually enabled new types of research questions to explore, as well as new forms of analysis. Of course, tape recorders introduced a new problem, and that is the burden of transcription. And I will talk about that later. Um, um, this slide also shows how technology has introduced new forms of data to analysis analyze. So the smartphone enabled everyone, not just researchers, to photograph and video their surroundings. So new type of research designs enabled respondent, made it easier to have respondent generated content. And the rise of social media and the digitalization of content, you know, books, articles available through the internet proved another rich source of data. But that raised the problem of how to analyze qualitative data at scale. And you've just heard about how machine learning and, and topic learning has been used to, to address that issue. So um, qualitative data analysis software developed in the 1980s with the rise of the personal computer, 
um, initially by a few social researchers who were trying to see if software could solve the problem of managing qualitative data. Um, Tom and Lynn Richards, who developed Nudist and Envivo, Udo and Anko Kutz developed Max and then Max QDA, Charlene has Fiber, Hyper Research, just to name a few. And they were translating their manual methods of organizing unstructured data, but also were uh, incorporating the affordances that software enables, primarily coding and retrieving. Um, so code and retrieve is something that um, the technology of that time was really good at. Um, and as these developments were happening pre-internet and in the very early days of the internet, um, they were slow to take off. And in fact, the developers were not aware initially of each other. And they were brought together in 1989 um, at a conference at Surrey University organized by Nigel Fielding and, and Ray Lee. Um, but these developments were not always accepted by the most mainstream influences, um, partly because they could not understand how a computer could support qualitative research. They could understand how it could support numbers and quantitative analysis. And so they raised concerns about how it would lead to the quantification of qualitative analysis, you know, counting and hypothesis testing as opposed to interpretation and construction, constructing theory. And some of these misconceptions persist even today. Um, so Jackson, Paulus, and Wolf published in 2018 um, an article called The Walking Dead Genealogy, illustrating how misconceptions persist through partial or incorrect citations of the early works where people were not sure what this new stuff, you know, meant. Um, and in particular, they they looked in their article at criticisms of um, that, you know, the software creates a barrier between the researcher and the data, limiting their ability to become close to and familiar with the data. So um, I suggest that you have a, a look at their article um, to, to get a, a better idea of that. So that's what I just wanted to do was to put all this into, into this into this context. And I'll just stop there. Um, Thank you, Silvana. Um, that's uh, all really useful historical context and also allows us to think about these new developments um, a little bit within that context. Susanna, would you like to add anything to uh, this point? You're on mute still, Susanna. When we were preparing the, the discussion, then I also kind of went back and, and looked at, at the historic development. And if anybody's interested in in more of that, I there's a, a, a blog. I, I actually did a presentation. And if, if you contact me, I can also... Uh, provide the link, then you have an, a whole hour more on, on that. But what I wanted to actually point out here, because I was going back, and if you now look at, while well, we at a new stage again with AI, you know, arriving on the scene, and go back to the publication of the 1990s, and look at what the concerns were there, and then also to see how how that is mirroring or what what Silvana, you know, thank you, you, you know, did a great job of, of, of outlining this all. And and that is very interesting to see. And also when when I followed now the discussions that we had or the, the QA and all the concerns people are raising, they are slightly different. But if you like, yeah, go back and look at the publications of the 1990s to kind of see also when the tape recorder come around and we see the same things. Uh, you know, repeating again in in a, a certain number of ways. So, just wanted to point out that, and and often we we forget those old publications because they're not digital. We have to. I mean, I would like to recommend the Nigel and Lee book from 1991 uh, about computer assisted analysis. Maybe we can share the title in the uh, somebody of you do that in the background to just just look at that. Great, thank you so much. So. Um, so in some ways, you were saying there are some parallels then to some of the concerns that the research community had in relation to the developments of some of these technological um, uh, aspects in the past. Do you think there are any ways in which what's happening now is sort of different to what we've seen before? Oh, and they took some notes. Um, well, one of it, of course, is the speech. You know, if you if you think back, 
uh, knew this 1985 and and then ethnograph came around and then five years later we had more of the you know max Goulier and atlas so that was like really you know long time span spans and and then other programs are coming in the last 30 years i mean it's uh, 35 years now and now ChatGPT came around of course everybody's talking about that but let's talk about large language models a year it's now a year and we have seen yeah, it's speedy development and it's still continuing and it's now, well, it was about text and now you can talk to ChatGPT and also uh, Jack was saying, yeah, soon you can also uh, ask questions about images and video and, you know, it's it's, it's moving just extraordinarily uh, fast. And I think that might, of course, again, yeah, there are people afraid of because you don't know where you're going to, you know, we don't know what's going, in, what's coming in a year's time. And I can see that that also produces lots of insecurities, uh, that kind of stuff. Well, in the um, one other thing I, that's not different, but the same what, what I see, and we will talk a bit about methodology a bit later, but if you look at the integration of AI now in existing tools, then uh, I see that it's similar to what has happened 30 years ago, because also when you go back to the book from from Lee and uh, from Nigel and uh, um, Fielding and and uh, Lee, that uh, people talked about coding already before there were programs, and, and they did it of course manually and uh, the you know, cutting and pasting. We all know that, but the terminology was already there, and then it was taken over into the computer. I, mean, I didn't know that. That was from rereading on uh, the book. It was actually becoming more aware of that, and I think that is seemed to be similar when we look at the integration of AI in the existing um, um, programs, and they kind of still integrate it into how you normally work with now programs like Max Wood A, or you know, we're talking about generative AI now in, in that aspect. And what could be different, and that is something I, I'm, I'm interested in, I'm busy with, is how we can reimagine analysis. And that would be different from from yeah. before. It's not just a continuation of what yeah. we had and maybe improvement to, to, to technology, but to just uh, kind of think or rethink uh, qualitative data. Yeah. yeah, we'll come a little bit more to that in a moment. So yeah, so to summarize there what you're reflecting on that in some ways, what might be a bit different about this development is A, the speed at which it's happening. Um, that in the past when new things were coming uh, on the scene that their arrival uh, didn't maybe make as much of, 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 a, of a massive splash in one moment. It, the awareness of it trickled through the community whilst here we are seeing a real tidal wave of, 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 um, of thinking around things. And I suppose there's also another aspect to this which is slightly unusual, which is that the tool is, is a tool that is available and is being used by individuals um, way outside the boundaries of research, right? So it's ubiquitous nature that it is being used, you know, by students to write essays, by um, people to try to, you know, summarize um, from different uh, uh, recipes what the best way of making a particular pie might be. You know, the fact that every it's in everyone's consciousness it, uh, and not just the consciousness of 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 researchers within that space that might make it a bit different okay thank you for that so we also wanted to just spend a tiny bit of time reflecting on how sometimes technological developments play out a little differently in different parts of the world so potentially leading to global inequalities in access um to developments Sylvana if I might um do you feel like this is likely to be the case with regards to developments of generative AI as well, or are we not so concerned about that? Yes, I mean, I've, um, I, I've, I've done some research, um, not specifically on that, but I, I, I did a survey and then I did in-depth interviews um, this summer, which was on um, um, researchers' um, attitudes to, to um, generative AI. And I, and I did talk to researchers who were um, from um, Africa, for example. And um, what was interesting 
was was that they were very positive. You know, I, I, I put to them, you know, is, is that, well, is it difficult, you know, to, to get access, to get internet access? And yes, but they persist. And also it's not just internet access, it's just um, electricity, you know, to, to be able to rely on electricity. In fact, one interview I had was the electricity kept going on and off. And of course that, that affected the internet. He persisted through it. Um, and what, what, what his view was, was, was just being able to have access to all this information that was free and all this, you know, I mean, chat GPT is free to be able to have access to that, um, mm. which is amazing when, when he doesn't have, you know, the funds to travel, you know, around the world to get things. So I thought that was quite an interesting attitude um, to that, that, that the sort of like the keenness to find the wherewithal mm -hmm. uh, to, to access um quite yeah. interesting yeah so we'll have to see how it plays out on a global um scale and and how it maps on or doesn't map on to existing inequalities and potentially exacerbate or, or not thank you so i'd like to move our discussion on to exploring the implications of ai on qualitative methodology and method and within this touching on something that susanna mentioned earlier on there are two questions that I have um, we've kind of come up with together that are kind of interesting ones to consider so on the one hand how do we employ existing methods of analysis using AI tools so how do we fit the tools to existing methods but secondly how might our existing methods change as a result of having these tools at our disposal so Maybe you'd like to start, Sirvana, by speaking to that for um, a couple of minutes. Okay, so um, if we start by looking at machine learning and non-generative AI, um, yeah, the kinds of AI that have been available to qualitative researchers, you know, for several years now, um, it's been mainly directed at managing qualitative data at scale. Um, and we've seen that in Discover Text, Leximancer and WordStat that were discussed um, here, um, as well as um, similar, probably not as powerful tools in, in the Cactus software, um, um, you know, such as NVivo, et cetera. Um, and the approach they support is content analysis. So I think it, it's, it's quite a sort of narrow area or very specific area. Um, and um, yeah, so, yeah, the, yeah. So, I mean, I think um, the main way that those tools have changed our methods is that it it has enabled analyzing large amounts of unstructured data um, that has become more and more available through the digitalization that's been happening in the past twenty years of you know in digital repositories, Twitter feeds, social media stuff, um, which wouldn't have been possible um, beforehand. And so it's it's basically the same sort of stuff that we've been doing with content analysis, but but at scale. Um, the exception is automated transcription, which um, has the potential to change the way we work. And the most obvious benefit is that it, it drastically reduces the amount of time to transcribe speech. And the rule of thumb before automation, if you remember, was that you needed to allow four hours transcription time for one hour of audio. And if the quality of the audio was poor or if someone spoke in a heavy accent, it could take much longer. And I think most people see it as a quick way to get transcription done, but it could have a more of an impact on our existing methods. Um, um, so because of the original time consuming nature of transcription, it, it was seen as a one-off technical task and it was not often seen as part of the analysis process as the practice was to send it off to someone else to transcribe or if you transcribe yourself, you were so focused on getting the words down that it just became a numb, mind numbing task, you know, inhibiting any chance of doing any kind of analysis. In fact, automation moves transcription from being an annoying task to being part of the analysis. And one affordance is that the words are linked to the audio or video so that you can both see and hear the words simultaneously. And that gives you a more nuanced um, interpretation than just reading the words on a transcript. Um, and it could also make you rethink your, your workflow. So instead of a linear workflow, which is data collection, transcription, coding, memoing, looking at patterns, writing up, um, 
data collection, transcription, and, and analysis are, are intertwined. Um, so working from an initial interview guide, you can conduct the initial interview, immediately upload the audio video, reflect on the transcript while reviewing it, and write up your reflections in a memo. And your reflections can lead you to revise your interview guide for your next interview. Or you can follow up the next day with a respondent to clear up any questions you have. Um, so you can immediately, and you can also immediately give the transcript for the respondent to review. So um, I think it's 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 thinking more about the workflow and and looking at the impact that it gives you, and also the fact that you can have a more nuanced in, in interpretation. Right. Um, Thank you. Right. Um, in terms of generative AI. Um, it's a bit too early to say how it will be used and the impact it will have on existing methods. Um, but I did do some research this summer exploring how people are experimenting with generative AI. Um, mm -hmm. And so they've been using it a lot as a writing assistant to improve their own writing, um, particularly by people um, who are not native English speakers who um, are submitting abstracts or articles to English language journals. Um, but also others are using it to restructure their writing and improve their style, um, create email templates, um, helping to structure a research proposal. Um, so that's one thing, um, which is as writing. They're also doing it to support with literature, um, finding literature, looking at links between literature. Um, so it gives you a more option to actually find out um, who's doing what. You know, I remember when I did my PhD back in the 70s and 80s, it was, um, there was someone who was doing a similar study to me in the States and you know, there was no internet then. And I, and yeah, I mean, I, I only found out after I finished mm -hmm. my PhD about this person. So, I mean, it's, you know, the world has changed so much, mm -hmm. um, but the linkages were quite powerful in, in the literature, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I'll stop there. Other Thank things. you. So no, that's really it's really interesting to reflect on that. I think what you're mentioning, Silvana, is are uh, aspects of the research process um, that are really important. The working with the materials and transcribing, the actual writing part of the analysis, the engaging with the existing knowledge in the field. These are all ways in which um these technologies can be of use. And so it's useful actually to reflect on the bit that is not necessarily the coding of the data or the engaging with the data, but also the other pieces around it. Um, I We have a bit of time, um, Susanna, for you also to perhaps provide your reflections firstly on how we employ existing methods of analysis using AI tools. So how do we fit the tool to the method? And secondly, how our existing methods of analysis might end up shifting or changing as a result of AI? Yeah, I... I like to maybe put it more you know, not an either or but maybe you know, also an addition uh, to, to what we're doing now yeah. i think what we see if i talk about generative ai and integration of that that is is kind of simplifying or supporting or better supporting what people are already doing in in a certain uh, extent Others, I think there's also uh, uh, some trial and experimentation going on. I mean, personally, I don't see at the current state of implementation that AI can take over the coding. I completely don't believe in that. And that has probably also to do with how it's implemented. I think it, we might get better results if the AI would, would first analyze the entire, entire data corpus and then suggest some codes. And there is actually some papers already done that say, well, the AI is more is better in deductive coding so if you give it if you give it a concept it can find the data that fit that concept but it's not so good in inductive coding and we see that in some of the implementation that you get the suggestion of 2000 codes why are you doing that with that you know that's mm -hmm. that's that's not gonna i think it's not going to be helpful at all because it, going through those uh, thousands of codes it takes you as long as doing it manually <laughs> in the first place so that route that been chosen to maybe just suggesting codes for a similar for one passage, and then you can decide. So that has more the assistant kind of role than rather than you know 
do it for you. So that is this one aspect in kind of enhancing and assisting tool and, and facilitating that. And the other aspect that I personally find much more interesting and, and I uh, is, is really to think out of the box. And I know that that a lot of people are still there. If, if I tell them, you know, life is out coding, you know, what wonderful it's going to be. That's kind of like, how are we supposed to be do that? You know, and, and I have been, been starting with ChatGPT, using it for the whatever, writing, you know, last Christmas problems and all that kind of stuff until I actually, um, thought about like, how actually can we use that for qualitative data and all this. So I've been playing around with that way before that thought actually occurred. And. So it seemed to be more natural, I guess, for me now to kind of go into conversation with the generative AI. And that's what I call that approach I want to work with. It's kind of like, well, we don't have to code data anymore. What is the purpose of coding? The purpose of coding is also to manage the data. We, you know, we cannot just keep 600 pages or 2,000 pages in our head. The AI can. That's not a problem. So it's a matter of asking the AI, where is that bit on where people talk about sustainability or where people talk about this? And that means we still need to know the data. It's not like you dump in 5,000 pages of text and you have no idea because then you don't know what kind of questions to ask. You still have to know an idea, have an idea and kind of remember, oh, there was, you know, Tom had a very specific uh, attitude about this. You know, how does that compare to what Anna said? And then you ask the AI and the AI can pull that out. And mm -hmm. it's not done for you you kind of in charge and you direct that and and that also entails of course you have to have to become familiar with the data so all of that is not going it's not going to be taken away and that's actually what i'm working right now on kind of like translating thematic analysis into how we do that with generative ai to kind of actually look more or what what are we actually want to achieve and then look not at the coding tool, but you know, maybe how we maybe you can achieve it in a different way. And I think it's more fun than coding because <laughs> it's interesting in the first bit, but then gets a bit boring. So that's what I'm very excited about. And I hope that I can also like help people along and and uh, giving some suggestions. And then, of course, also maybe being able to do that together and like, you know, I said, like, you know, this is my suggestions and you know, people can practice this and we can improve from there and do continue to develop methodology. But I don't think that needs to be an either or, you know, it can still be, I think still there's a need for people to work with programs that do code because for now they can do the counting better if you want to uh, count data. And that's what we know large language models are not so good at, but the future will be interesting. Yeah, excellent. Well, Thank you so much. Could I just add? Yeah, uh, of course. Uh, I mean, I. Um, I mean, I think the important thing is to, to, to understand that methodology is constantly evolving. And, you know, the example that I gave about um, um, the, um, you know, um, transcription, well, mm. not transcription, but the, the, the fact of the um, tape recorder um, enabled sort of conversation analysis as a method to, to evolve and develop. And I think the same thing is sort of here mm -hmm. is that here's an opportunity to um, think about how methodology is evolving. And yes, coding, as Suzanne said, is just about ways to manage all this unstructured information. Um, and um, and I think it is helpful to think beyond coding, um, as Suzanne was 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 um, saying. Um, and 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 it's but it's it's all down to as qualitative researchers is that we know, we should know how to ask questions. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's knowing it, it's, it's becoming, you know, honing those skills, question asking, interrogating um, the AI tool um, is, 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 is the skill set that we need to develop. Yeah. I think we heard a lot of that from the developers earlier in the session, a number of people talking about the importance of good listening um, and the importance of the role of the researcher in um, in working with the materials, in taking charge of what is meaningful interaction with the data, and that these tools can be an assistant in that, but they they can't they can't take away um, they they can't be front of that dialogue. The researcher needs to be in dialogue. Yeah, thank you so much. So in the last um, couple of minutes that we've got. Um, I'd like to move 
onto the idea of how researchers can be equipped to navigate the developments in these technologies whilst maintaining methodological rigor and particularly how might these developments impact researchers at different stages in their career? There was a question earlier on about how this maps onto the kind of novice researcher, that sort of thing. Uh, and what responsibilities do more experienced researchers have in relation to this? Susanna, do you have um, a few reflections for us? We've only got a few more minutes, but it would be really lovely to hear. Yeah. yeah. But it was also the question, you know, what lessons can we learn from the past? Yeah. And I think the Cactus Project helped tremendously to educate people. So, you know, we need to continue having that maybe also in the space of AI. And then we know that the younger people actually adopted the technology faster than the old, older ones. And we still see that when in, in qualitative methodology courses, teachers don't teach Cactus. It's just stu that students have to teach themselves. And I think it needs to be the senior research or the people who are professors today that actually kind of say, well, we need to go into the leads and we need to actually sit down and look at that in order then, and maybe together with the students, to then also teach it. And I think that's something maybe I think we can also learn from the past because I think that didn't happen, that actually senior people looked at, okay, we have that new technology. It was more like, oh, yeah, we, and 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 it would be nice if that would be the other way around this time. Yeah, thank you. Savannah, any reflections on that issue? Yes, because, I mean, basically cactus tools were in the lab. There was the lab and there's, a, the, you know, it was, it was literally a separation between the craft and the thinking and and not much integration of of, of the two. Um, but I mean, I did have um, one person who I interviewed who reflected what she was concerned about was that um, senior researchers would actually use um, AI as a research assistant and not employ research assistants and therefore losing that tradition of mentoring the younger generation up and how to use the tools. And I thought that was an interesting point she made um, to, to watch out for, um, um, that the senior researchers might, yeah, yeah, might save money um, by not having research assistants. And you're losing that that mentoring, you know, bring, bringing up the new generation of, of, of how to use these tools. So I just thought that was just an interesting reflection that she had, you know, to, to think about. Yeah, and I wonder the extent to which um, it may become a, an okay thing to, instead of um, validate your coding with another human researcher, you validate it with a non-human researcher. Yeah, uh, interesting ideas. Thank you so much, both of you, for your time today. I've really enjoyed uh, talking to you, and uh, we could continue for a lot lot longer there's been lots of questions in the chat thank you so much we didn't schedule a Q&A for this we thought the set the symposium session was long enough as it is but we are going to collate those and have a little think about the spaces in which we can continue to have these discussions but thanks um first to Zavanna and Susanna for sharing your thoughts with us here um and though we need to finish today it's not the end of the discussion and I'm sure that you're um both going to continue to disseminate your own thinking, Zavanna and Zuzana, on these issues in a variety of different forms. Yes, thank you very much, uh, ladies. I really enjoyed uh, that discussion uh, and I thought it was a lovely kind of pulling together of some of the things that we heard uh, earlier and also some things for us all to think about uh, in the future. So big thanks to you. And again, thanks again to our earlier uh, presentations uh, as well. So Sarah mentioned uh, next time. Uh, so next time we have two parts to our second part. Uh, the first part will be uh, some researcher presentations and we've got three of them. Uh, we've got David Morgan who's going to be talking about analyzing qualitative data using chat GPT uh, and making some comparisons between analyzing data that way uh, and analyzing it in a more um, uh, traditional coding, uh, manual coding way. Uh, then we're going to hear from some ethnographers who are working uh, 
at Ipsos, a market research company in the UK, and they are going to be talking about how they're using AI throughout the whole research cycle. So not just for analysis, but for the whole research cycle. And then we're also going to hear from Steve Wright, uh, who is an independent cactus consultant uh, and a lecturer at a university here in the UK, who's going to be talking about transparency and qualitative analysis using machine learning uh, and talking about making informed choices uh, between different tools and also explaining uh, some of the insights that may be generated through them. So that's going to be the first part of next week. The second part is going to be an expert panel when we have got uh, government researcher, an academic uh, and a market research um, expert talking about uh, the ethics uh, of these tools, as well as some of the opportunities uh, that they um, uh, that they pose in different uh, settings. Uh, so that will be a panel discussion. So thank you all very much for being here. I'm just going to post a last few things in the chat, one of which is our feedback form. We are very, very interested in hearing what you thought about today. Uh, and also any ideas you have about how we can keep the conversation going. So we're very keen to hear from you. What would you like more of? Uh, how can we um, provide spaces to continue this conversation in various ways? We can see from the chat that there's lots of conversations to be had. So let us know what you think would be useful um, spaces and places that we can uh, facilitate the continuing um, discussion. OK. Thank you very much. It's Friday afternoon for many of us. I know it's the middle of the night for some people, uh, but thank you all very, very much um, and hopefully see many of you next week.